I spent some time last weekend at my buddy Cadell's cabin up in the Ozarks. It's one of those rustic affairs tucked back in the woods, perfect for disconnecting. Well, except for that one damn bar of service you get if you stand on the porch and lean just right against the railing, but who checks their phone when you're out there, right? Cadell and I go way back. We met in college, bonded over being broke, bad at sports, and both having the misfortune of majoring in something called integrative studies. The man has more random survival skills than Bear grills. He can probably start a fire with two popsicle sticks and a wad of bubblegum. Me, I'm more the order take out and pray we have enough plates kind of guy. Anyway, we're driving up there Friday afternoon. It's about a three-hour haul from St. Louis, all back roads and winding hills once you get close. We're blasting old-school hip-hop and catching up on life. Turns out, Cadell's getting married. Not sure how he landed a woman willing to put up with his wilderness obsession, but hey, good for him. Right when I'm about to roast him for going soft, the road takes a sharp turn, and there it is. The Ozarks in full fall glory trees ablaze with reds and yellows, the whole thing looking like a postcard exploded. We both just kind of go silent for a second, soaking it in. The cabin itself? It's like something out of a horror movie, but in a good way. Old logs, a wraparound porch, one of those big stone chimneys, the works. Honestly, kinda surprised the place hasn't been rented out for some slasher flick yet. We unload the truck, mostly beer, snacks, and enough firewood to last us a week. Cadell gets the key in the lock, swings open the ancient creaking door, and we step into darkness. Power must be out, he grumbles. Let me grab the flashlights. Turns out, Cadell keeps a whole stash of supplies under the sink. We get those going, toss our stuff into our usual rooms, and then the first order of business, crack open some beers. It's not even that late, but hey, we're on vacation. Evening goes by pretty standard for a Cadell trip. Fire in the pit, way too much grilled meat, and me losing spectacularly at every card game known to man. Around midnight we decide to turn in. Here's where things start to get weird. I'm lying in bed, the silence of the woods thick around me. It's one of those rare pitch black nights, no moon to speak of. I'm about to drift off when I hear it, a scratching sound just outside the window. Now I'm a city boy, raccoons rummaging through trash, that's about the extent of my wildlife experience. But this, this was different. Heavy, and way too close. Cadell, I hiss, but the man is dead asleep, snoring loud enough to raise the roof. The scratching gets louder, and I swear I hear a low growl. My heart's pounding like a drum solo. I grab my phone off the nightstand, flick on the flashlight. Nothing out the window, just the inky blackness of the trees. I tell myself it's just my imagination playing tricks, but I can't shake the feeling I'm being watched. The rest of the night, I lie there, stiff as a board, listening, waiting for whatever was out there to make its move. Next morning, I stumble out of bed, ready to spill the beans to Cadell about my night visitor. But as soon as I see him, I stop. He's already at the kitchen table, face pale, staring out the window. You're not going to believe this, he says, not turning around. Try me. I croak, my throat suddenly dry. He points a shaky finger out at the yard. It takes me a second to make sense of what I'm seeing. There are gashes across the ground, like something big had been dragged through the dirt, leading right up to the edge of the woods. Then I see it, on the big oak at the tree line, three deep claw marks gouged into the bark. They're high at least seven feet off the ground. 
Whatever made those wasn't just some oversized raccoon. Cadale and I stare at each other. He goes for the hunting rifle he keeps mounted above the fireplace. What the hell are we dealing with? I ask, voice barely a whisper. Don't know, he says, but we're gonna find out. We spend the rest of the morning tracking whatever it was. We find more of those big scratches on trees, prints in the soft ground that are the size of dinner plates, but no sign of the creature itself. By the time the sun starts to go down, we're no closer to figuring this out. The air feels heavy, charged with a tension that has nothing to do with the weather. That night, we both sleep with our boots on. Cadell's got the rifle propped beside his bed, and I've got the biggest kitchen knife I could find under my pillow. We don't bother with the fire, just sit in the darkness, listening to the night sounds. Around 2 a.m., we hear it again. That scratching. It's circling the cabin, closer this time. And under that, there's something else. A panting, snuffling sound that makes the hair on my neck stand on end. Cadeo eases the rifle off the bed, flicks off the safety. I grab my knife, feeling ridiculous and terrified at the same time. There's a thud against the wall, then another. It's trying to get in. I say, my voice barely above a whisper. Cadeo peers through the crack in the curtains. I can see shapes moving through the shadows, massive and misshapen. Then, in the dim light, I catch a glimpse of it. Standing on its hind legs, easily eight feet tall, was a hunched figure covered in coarse, dark fur. Its claws were long and wicked. But the worst part its head. The muzzle was long and pointed, and as it opened its jaws in a guttural snarl, it revealed rows of razor-sharp teeth. And those eyes. They stared directly at us, glowing an unnatural yellow in the darkness. Cadeo raises the rifle, his hands shaking slightly. I'm too scared to move. He fires. The roar of the rifle shatters the night. One of the creatures shrieks a horrible, wounded sound that cuts through me more than the gunshot did. There's chaos for a few moments, crashing sounds, snarls, and that damn shrieking over and over. Then a heavy thud, and silence. One of them is down, but how many more are out there? Kadeel is reloading with trembling hands. Stay down, he whispers, and stay behind me. I want to protest, want to say I'm not some helpless damsel, but the sight of those things outside the window has knocked all the smart ass out of me. I press myself back against the wall, feeling the rough wood against my back, heart pounding so hard I'm sure those monsters can hear it a mile away. Cadell peeks out the window again. I think I got it. Think the others ran off. He steps towards the door. Rifle raised. Don't be a damn hero. I hiss, but it's useless. He cracks open the door, just a sliver, and peers out. Nothing. He eases it open further, slow, cautious. Steps out onto the porch, scanning the treeling. Then it happens so fast it's a blur. A dark shape hurtles out of the darkness, straight at Cadale. There's a flash of claws, a scream cut brutally short, and then an explosion of red as the creature rips into him. I can't move, can't breathe, can only stand there frozen in horror, watching. Cadell's on the ground, wrestling with the beast, his rifle tossed aside. Blood's everywhere. The creature is huge, incredibly strong, and Cadell, Cadell's losing. Suddenly... Something snaps inside of me. It's more than fear, more than rage. It's that white-hot desperation that comes when you have nothing left to lose. Scooping up the rifle, I take aim. It's a long shot, and the creature's moving fast, but I fire. And again. With each shot, it staggers, its grip on Cadell's slipping. Finally, 
With a final howl, it collapses. I drop the rifle and rush to Caudale. He's still alive, but barely. Gasping, clutching at the brutal gashes across his chest. Hang on. I choke out, voice cracking. Just hang on. I grab some towels. I don't know. To stop the bleeding? It seems pathetic against the carnage. Press them against the wounds, but they just soak through. His eyes start to dim. Didn't think I'd go out like this. He coughs up blood, a wry grin twisting his mouth. Shut up, I say, my voice shaking. You're not going anywhere. He looks up at me, his eyes clear now. Take care of her, yeah? Tell Alara, tell her I. His voice trails off. And just like that, he's gone. I don't remember much after that. Shock, I guess. Calling the cops, the ambulance, none of it registers. It's like I'm on autopilot, going through the motions, while inside there's just this howling emptiness. When the police finally arrive, it's well past daybreak. They find the bodies of the creatures, two of them in the end. Huge, misshapen things, unlike any animal they'd ever encountered. The wildlife officials were baffled, some even muttering about a hoax. They took my statement, asked a million questions, poked and prodded at the cabin with their flashlights and evidence markers. Nobody believed a word of what I told them about the size of the things, the way they looked. But I didn't care. They told me Cadell died a hero, saving my life. But I don't feel like any hero. Just a scared, broken nest left behind. They shipped the creature bodies off for some hush-hush government testing. Said the results would take months. I doubt I'll ever hear what they find, if anything. The cabin's still there, of course. Boarded up now, a constant reminder. Sometimes I think about going back, cleaning the place up, reclaiming the space. But then I remember that night, remember Cadale, and I know I never will. People told me time would heal wounds, but some wounds go too deep. The nightmares, they never really went away. I catch glimpses sometimes, out of the corner of my eye, hulking shadows in the dark, a flicker of yellow eyes. I know they're not real, can't be, and yet. The locals started whispering about it, of course. Tall tales of a monster in the woods, the Ozarks Howler, they called it. Just some campfire story to spook the tourists, that's all. But somewhere deep down, a part of me wonders, and waits for the night it comes back for me. I was doing field research in the remote forests of northern Michigan, and let me tell you, sometimes being a wildlife biologist isn't all glamorous hikes and cute critters. No, sometimes it's a whole lot of slogging through swamps, swatting mosquitoes the size of hummingbirds, and wishing you had one more rain poncho. My name's Ryland, by the way, and this story isn't about those pesky mosquitoes, although I may have to tell you about those another time. The Upper Peninsula gets crazy amounts of snow, and that spring things were melting fast. I was up there to monitor a small wolf pack I'd been tracking for the past few years. We were pretty sure one of the females was getting ready to den, and finding those dens was important research. It helped us get estimates on populations, assess pup survival rates, the usual scientific stuff. But on this particular day, all I could think about was getting out of these wet socks. The terrain was tricky, a dense mix of pine, young birch turning that spring green color, and lots of mucky marsh. We'd been hiking since dawn, me and my two interns, Jimena and Dion. They were tough kids, all fired up to learn. I liked that. Sometimes felt like being their grizzled guide through the wilds, even though I'm not even thirty yet. 
Hey, Re, how much further? Dion's got this booming voice, echoes through the trees. We're close. Last known range was in this sector. I called back, pulling out the GPS unit that was practically glued to my hand. One signal bar flickered weakly. Man, my feet are soaked, he grumbled. Never thought Michigan was this squishy. Jimena laughed from a few yards back. I told you to bring those waterproof boots, Dion. I thought you were just trying to sell me more stuff, Jimena. He gave her a playful shove. I shook my head with a smile. Those two kept me on my toes. All right, all right, break's over. I interjected before their bickering got out of hand. Signal's strongest straight ahead. Let's see if we can't find that mama wolf. Something rustled up ahead, a big sound for a squirrel or bird. Dion went quiet, the way he did when really focused on tracking. You guys hear that? He whispered, eyes scanning the underbrush. I held up a fist, signaling them to freeze. In the sudden silence, I could hear it too, a low, rhythmic thump. Not footsteps, something heavier, methodical. Bear? Jimena whispered, looking wide-eyed. I shook my head. Bear tracks don't sound like that. It was too even, too purposeful. Maybe a big buck? Dion offered, though his whisper held a nervous edge. Then we saw it. Not through the trees, which were dense here, but in the marshy patch to our left. There was a break in the foliage, an open space leading down to a little muddy pond. And in that space was something huge. Shambling, hunched, its form almost lost in shadows despite the afternoon sun. Instincts kicked in, the biologist instincts. At first, all I could do was catalog the details, size of a large bear, but bipedal. The hunched back, the way its arms dragged knuckles on the ground. Dark, coarse fur, and then it turned its head. Those were not bear features. The snout was too long, the jaw jutting out oddly, and the eyes. Jesus, the eyes? They gleamed in almost unnatural yellow, catching the light despite the dappled shade. There was something so wrong about them, like they were set at an inhuman angle. My brain stalled on the word. Wrong. Not bear or wolf, not anything I'd ever seen in textbooks or in the remote camera footage we checked. Dion and Jimena were stock still behind me, their breaths like shallow gasps. The thing made a sound then, a low whine that grated at my nerves. It dropped onto all fours and began lumbering towards the pond. Still no words came to mind. Just the image of it burned into my brain, the loping gait, the way its back fur rippled like it had too many vertebrae in its spine. W, what is that? Dion finally stammered out. That seemed to break the spell. I don't know. I hissed back, my voice trembling slightly despite my best efforts. But we need to get the hell out of here. Quietly. Turning, we retreated, step by careful step, eyes locked on that hunched form now slurping at the pond's edge. The rustling of its passage through the brush unnerved me more than outright confrontation might have. It wasn't aware of us, or didn't care. We backed off maybe a hundred yards, adrenaline making every twitch of a branch sound like snapping gunfire. Only then did I dare pull out the radio. I had to report this thing, whatever it was. Just as I began to speak, a scream shattered the tense silence of the forest. It was Jimena. Her scream was cut short replaced by a terrified gurgle. We whipped around, Dion already pulling the bear spray off his belt. But there was no time, just a blur of dark fur and a flash of those unnaturally wide eyes. One moment Jimena was there, the next, there was only a tangle of ripped fabric snagged on a bush and the blood. We didn't find her, 
not anything identifiable. Whatever that thing was, it moved fast, and it moved into thick foliage where we couldn't track it. Dion and I stumbled back toward the trailhead, supporting each other more than either of us cared to admit. The park rangers arrived, took our statements, started a search and rescue, standard procedure. But we all knew. Here's where the story stops. We didn't get a good look at that creature, not long enough to identify it. I've filed my report, but they've labeled it in. Unconfirmed predator encounter. Bear may be a stray wolf, anything but the truth. But I know what I saw. They never found Humane either. Some things, man, they don't leave a body for you to bury. I moved up to Washington State from California less than a month ago. For most of my life, I was stuck in that dry, hot desert town. Up here, though, it's paradise. I have this cabin out in the woods, surrounded by all green. Like, I can't even see another single building dude. That first full day in my new place, I hiked like ten miles just to explore the woods. I went to sleep tired, but with this sense of peace, like I'd finally found the right place for me. Let me tell you about my cabin. It's one of those old school ones, mostly wood, with a screen in porch that just wraps around the whole house. Inside, there's this giant stone fireplace that seriously looks like it's out of a fairy tale. I swear, you could probably roast an entire animal carcass in that thing. And man, I found this rocking chair right next to the fireplace. Total heaven. My name's Kai, by the way. Short for Caden. See, unique name, but not in that weird, pretentious way. Anyway, since I moved in, I've been exploring all around this area. Found a few hiking trails, waterfalls, the works. It's incredible. But here's the weird part. One day, I was out by this creek I found, skipping rocks and all that, when I got this feeling, man, it was like a shiver went down my spine and the hair on my neck was standing on end. I glanced around, and that's when I saw them for the first time, prints. The creek bed was muddy, and there were these huge paw prints. Definitely not from a bear, those I know. These were different. Narrower at the heel, wider toes, almost human-like, but too big. And something about the way they were spaced felt off. You know what those videos of Bigfoot look like on YouTube? That long, loping stride? Same kind of vibe. I gotta admit, I got a bit freaked out. There's a lot of wilderness back here, sure, but I never expected to find anything like that. Later that night... Man, I had trouble sleeping. It wasn't even a full moon or anything. It was pitch black outside. And I kept hearing stuff, branches cracking under heavy footsteps, low grunts, like muffled breathing. I started thinking, nah, it's just deer or something. But in my gut, it felt wrong. The next morning, I went back out to that same creek, figured it was just my nerves the other day. But there were more prints. And this time, I noticed something else. A weird smell. Kinda sweet, kinda musky. I don't know how to even describe it, but it wasn't animal-like. That was when I knew I wasn't just imagining things. There was something out there, something big, and it seemed like it was watching me. So, after all that, right? You'd think I'd pack up move back to civilization. But here's the thing, man. I'm stubborn. Or maybe just curious. So yeah, I got a little spooked, but I also got this fire lit under me. I wanted to know what the hell was in my woods. I figured, even if it was something dangerous, better to face it than live in fear. I started leaving bait out, 
hunks of meat, old fish guts, anything stinky enough to get something's attention. I got myself a motion-activated camera, the kind hunters use, and strapped it to a tree facing the bait. It took a few nights, but sure enough, I struck gold one morning. Or, I guess not gold exactly, more like nightmare fuel. There it was, in clear view. My mystery creature. The thing I had been smelling and hearing, it was no Bigfoot, dude. I couldn't believe my eyes even when the picture was right in front of my face. This thing moved on two legs, that much I could see. It was probably seven feet tall, hunched over a bit, but built lean and ripped. And the head, it was like a warped version of a human, with this flat muzzle full of fangs and eyes that glowed silver in the flash of the camera. The fur, it looked matted and coarse, patchy like it was molting or something. And there were claws on its fingers that looked sharper than any hunting knife I'd ever seen. I know, it sounds crazy. But trust me, I saw it clear as day. And that's when the fear really kicked in. I wasn't curious anymore, man. I was straight up terrified. That was no animal. It was something else entirely. It was something unnatural. I went straight to my truck and drove into town. Got a gun at the sporting goods store. A shotgun, yeah, the kind with real stopping power. I know those aren't ideal for hunting, too much spread, but at this point, I didn't care about aiming. I just wanted something to protect myself if that thing came near my cabin. That night, I loaded up my shotgun and parked myself on my rocking chair on the porch, the best view out of the house. I stayed out there all night, didn't even try to sleep. And let me tell you the noises. The rustling of leaves, the cracking of underbrush. Every single sound made me jump. But nothing came. At sunrise, I was exhausted and frustrated. Had I gone full-on crazy? Maybe that camera had caught a deer or something, and my nerves turned it into some kind of monster. I'm writing this right now at a little diner in town getting some breakfast after the longest night of my life. I'm still trying to decide if I should even go back to the cabin. I mean, I got all my stuff there, but is any of it worth dying over? That's when I notice a group of guys in camouflage, the kind you see driving monster trucks, all crowded around a newspaper. I glance over and see why they're so excited. The headline reads, Body found Malden National Forest. I gotta go check this out. See, the thing is, I'm the only one out there in this part of the woods. Everyone else is way further north, at least an hour's drive. So whoever this poor dude is, well, it might give me a clue about what exactly I'm dealing with out here. All right, yeah, that's probably a stupid reason to go back to the woods but I can't just sit here with the question hanging in the air. Plus, part of me wants to prove myself wrong. There's a tiny voice in the back of my head still saying maybe it was all just in my imagination. Maybe I saw shadows and deer tracks and worked myself up into a frenzy over nothing. But something tells me, as I drive out of town and get closer to my cabin, that I know the truth. The truth is... I'm not alone in these woods. It's time for me to find out if I'm the hunter, or if I'm the prey. The drive back to the cabin was a nightmare. Each twist and turn deeper into the heart of the woods put me further on edge. It felt like there were eyes on me, like it knew I was coming back. When I finally pulled into the gravel drive, I grabbed my shotgun and did a wide sweep of the area peering into the trees and shadows. Nothing. Just the rustling leaves and the eerie quiet. It felt like my entire body was buzzing with adrenaline. I made my way slowly up to the porch. Everything looked completely normal, almost boring. 
no sign of whatever creature had been stalking me the past few weeks. But I had seen the picture on that camera. The thing was real, and it was somewhere out there. Entering the cabin felt different. The sense of peace and isolation had vanished. The shadows seemed thicker, almost suffocating. For the first time, I noticed how exposed all those windows made me. This place felt less like a home, more like a trap. With a shaking hand, I took down the camera and checked the memory card. I half expected it to be mangled or broken, just another piece of evidence mysteriously gone. But there they were, more photos, clear as day. My creature, standing over the fresh carcass of a deer. And something else, another creature with the same silver eyes, the same gnarled claws. There wasn't just one of them. There were at least two. I felt a surge of nausea mixed with a grim sort of determination. This thing, these things, they weren't gonna scare me out of my home. Suddenly, a noise from outside shattered my tense focus. It sounded like a heavy body scraping against the cabin wall. Then came a low, guttural growl, vibrating through the wood. I dropped the camera and scrambled for my shotgun. I couldn't see anything out the windows, but that sound, it was directly beneath me. The floorboards creaked and groaned. Something was trying to push its way up from the crawl space. My heart pounded so loud I thought my ribs would crack. It felt like those old horror movies, you know, when the zombie arm breaks through the floor? That's what flashed through my mind as I slowly backed towards the fireplace, gun raised. With a sickening crunch, splintered wood erupted from the floor and a massive, matted arm reached up, claws scrabbling for purchase. The musky, rotten smell that clung to it nearly knocked me over. I fired the shotgun without thinking, the deafening blast echoing in the small cabin. Black blood splattered the walls, and the arm jerked back with a roar that shook the house. There was a long silence. I waited, breathing ragged, for it to try again. But nothing came, except for the dull drip of blood pooling on the floor. That's when I saw it, dragging itself away from the house. It was injured, limping on three legs, the fourth one hanging limp and broken. I had heard it. A wave of relief washed over me, then a surge of adrenaline. If I could hurt it, I could kill it. I had a chance. I stumbled outside, shotgun clutched in sweating hands. The creature had vanished into the woods, leaving a trail of black blood leading away from the cabin. I swallowed back the fear and followed. It couldn't have gotten far. The woods were silent and still, save for the pounding of my own heart. That's when I found it, and its mate. They were crouched beneath the roots of an ancient cedar, eyes like burning coals gleaming in the half-light. The injured one whimpered, and the other snarled at me, flashing its monstrous fangs. I raised my gun, and somehow kept my hand steady. I fired once, twice, three times. The creatures howled in rage and pain, but the woods swallowed the sound, leaving nothing but the buzzing in my ears and the scent of gunpowder. When the smoke cleared, the ground was littered with black blood and two mangled bodies, their eyes finally dim. The aftermath? Let's just say it took weeks to clean up the mess. I called a few buddies. Told them a bear attacked me. We burned the bodies and buried what was left. Nobody asked many questions. It was the kind of place where stories like mine spread quickly, transforming into whispers about creatures in the woods. Locals probably added mine to their arsenal of fireside tales, warnings about the things that lurked in the shadows. The Wendigo, or maybe they'd call it a skinwalker. Honestly, I don't even care what name they give it. I stayed at the cabin, finished turning it into a fortress, you could say. But I won't lie, every creek at night, 
Every rustling leaf outside, it sends a shiver down my spine. Some nights I still see those silver eyes in the darkness. But now I know. I know I'm not the hunted here. I'm the hunter. I spent some time last weekend at my buddy Elwyn's place up in the Catskills. This was no luxury trip, mind you. Elwyn inherited this old cabin from his grandpa. It's barely more than a shack, honestly. Tiny, no running water, and about a quarter mile hike off the nearest dirt road. I swear that old wood-burning stove takes hours to get the chill out of those two cramped rooms. But Elwyn's been doing some work fixing it up, and it's got the best view out over the woods you can imagine, so who am I to complain? I'm Nash, by the way. City guy, born and raised, and not exactly what you'd call an outdoorsman. We got there late Friday, and after unpacking the bare necessities, spent the night shooting the breeze and drinking the cheap whiskey I'd brought. Elwyn's been going through a tough time, messy breakup with his long-term girlfriend, so I figured just getting him out of the city and listening to him complain about women would do him good. And yeah, I was pretty keen on getting out of my tiny apartment too. In the morning, we got out early. One of the cool things about Elwyn's place is that it butts right up against a huge swathe of state forest land. He had some vague ideas about clearing a spot for a vegetable garden, so he brought along a couple of axes and a saw. Figured if we chopped, hauled, and cleared enough wood before sundown, we might be able to get a fire pit going and roast something for dinner. We were making decent progress, Elwyn's surprisingly good with an axe, when something further into the woods caught my eye. Just a flash of movement between the trees. At first I thought it might be a deer, but the shape was all wrong, too bulky. Hey, you see that? I asked Elwyn mid-swing. He stopped and looked his eyes squinting into the trees. Nah, man, nothing. Probably just a squirrel. Shrugging it off, we got back to work. But something was nagging at me. That thing, the way it moved, it didn't seem right. A couple of minutes later, I saw it again, and this time a chill ran through me. I froze, the half-split log in my hand suddenly feeling very heavy. Elwyn! There. Look. I pointed, my voice a bit shakier than I'd have liked. He followed my finger, frowning slightly. Where? Right there, dude. It moved through the trees. There was a long silence. Elwyn looked at me like I was maybe having a stroke. I think you need to chill out, he said finally. Probably just the shadows getting to you. I wanted to argue, to insist I wasn't imagining things, but looking into the dense woods, I couldn't see anything myself anymore. I felt stupid suddenly, and the tension drained out of me. Elwyn started chopping again, muttering something about me probably needing new glasses. I joined him, but I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. We broke for lunch at about one. Nothing fancy. Just some dried sausage and jerky I had in my pack. I tried to make a joke about needing red meat for the mosquitoes, but it fell flat. Elwyn hadn't stopped giving me side eyes since the weirdness that morning. After a half-hearted attempt to get more chopping done, we decided to head back to the cabin and get a proper fire going inside. The evening was starting to get pretty chilly. And being totally honest... I'd lost my enthusiasm for being deep in those woods. We had dinner around seven, some rehydrated camp food that honestly wasn't awful, even if it probably shaved a few years off our lifespans. Afterward, I topped off our whiskeys and settled in with one of my old paperbacks. But man, I could not focus. Those trees, that feeling of unseen eyes, 
It was all I could think about. We were sitting there, not really talking, just listening to the crackle of the burning wood, when we both heard it. A thud outside, like something heavy landing on the roof. My heart jumped. I looked at Elwyn. He was white as a sheet. He slowly put down his whiskey and stood up. I followed, my skin prickling. Something was clawing at the roof, the sound echoing loudly in the small cabin. Then, there was a scrape, a slithering movement. A strangled sound escaped Elwyn's throat. What the hell is that? His voice trailed off into a whisper. I didn't answer. I couldn't, because at that moment, a dark shape slid across the small, dirty window. Whatever it was, it was big, and its body didn't look right. It seemed to twist and coil in ways that shouldn't be possible. It had way too many limbs, some long and thin like branches, others thick and, honestly, I couldn't even look directly at them. Just seeing that shape scrambling over the window made my head swim with nausea. Then it was gone. It dropped away from view as suddenly as it had appeared. I heard a thud, followed by scrabbling noises on the wooden shingles. There was silence. A heavy, awful silence. Finally, Elwyn turned to me, his voice almost a squeak. I need to get my gun. He was referring to the shotgun his grandpa had left at the cabin, an old-timer pump-action thing that hangs above the fireplace. I nodded, my heart still hammering against my ribs. Elwyn didn't waste any time. He snatched the shotgun off the wall and started racking shells into it. He looked like a different person. The fear melted away, replaced by a grim determination. He motioned towards the cabin's tiny bedroom. You stay here. If anything comes through that window, you scream like hell, all right? His eyes were hard, focused, and I honestly felt a flicker of relief. Owen might think I'm a city softer, but I knew in that moment that he'd go down fighting if he had to. I crouched beside the small window in the bedroom, trying to peer out into the darkness. The moon was out, casting enough light that I could just make out the line of the woods. My hands were shaking so badly it was almost comical. Every creak of the cabin, every rustle of the wind through the trees, made me flinch. I don't know how long I waited, my ears straining for the slightest noise, but it felt like an eternity. Suddenly, I heard another thud, softer this time. My heart lurched. Was that thing sneaking around? Waiting for us to drop our guard? Then there was a scraping sound, right outside the bedroom window. Something scratched across the weathered sill. And then it came, a horrible, wheezing hiss, followed by a wet, smacking noise. Like something was, licking the glass. I let out a yell, pure terror tearing out of my throat. I heard a blast, the roar of Elwyn's shotgun, followed by a shriek that echoed through the woods, a sound that was almost human, but not quite. Then, more scrabbling on the roof, like something was retreating in a hurry. Elwyn was back at the bedroom door in an instant. His face was drawn, covered in sweat. Did you see it? What was it? I asked, my voice trembling. He shook his head. No, but it wasn't something normal, Nash. I hit it. I know I did. But there's no blood, nothing. It got away. Just then, we heard something else. A scratching sound from below, down in the main room of the cabin. I felt the blood drain from my face. That thing had gone in the front door. We ran out of the bedroom, the shotgun clutched in Elwyn's trembling hands. Moonlight flooded through the cabin's front window, and immediately I saw it, a dark, twisted shape sprawled on the floor. Oh my God! My heart was in my throat. It looked impossibly huge, a mass of tangled limbs and pulsing, mottled skin. 
Elwyn raised his gun, his finger hovering over the trigger. Wait, I hissed. Look. I pointed towards the window. In the moonlight, I could see a trail of something dark, glistening and viscous like slime. It led from the window outside, disappearing into the woods. It's hurt, I realized. My God, Elwyn, you hit it. We crept towards the creature. It didn't move, though the air thrummed with its labored breathing. Even from a distance I could smell it, a damp, rotting odor mixed with something that made my stomach turn. And then, it slowly opened its eyes. They were milky and multifaceted, like an insect's, perched on top of a bulbous head that pulsed rhythmically. I stifled the cry as my gaze was drawn downward, to its open jaw filled with rows of needle-like teeth. Elwyn, as pale as death, took a step closer and raised the shotgun. Do it, I whispered. I didn't want this thing to suffer, didn't want to think what it might become once it recovered. A blast echoed through the cabin, and then the thing erupted with an unholy screech that ripped the night apart. It thrashed blindly, knocking over chairs, splintering the old table. Elwyn fired again. And again. The thing was a whirlwind of movement, spewing dark liquid. Then, with a last, shuddering heave, it fell still. We didn't speak. Didn't move. Just stood there, breathing heavily in the silence. In the morning, we buried it in a shallow grave far away from the cabin. We didn't say much. What was there to say? We collected our stuff and got the hell out of there as fast as we could. I kept looking nervously over my shoulder all the way back to Elwyn's truck, expecting a shadow in the woods, but there was nothing. The drive home was tense. We stuck to the main roads, avoiding any glimpse of those dark, endless trees. At one point Elwyn finally spoke. Did you ever figure out what that thing was? I thought back to the shape, to the eyes reflecting the moonlight. People in these parts have stories, you know, I said slowly. Stories about something old, something hungry that lives deep in the woods. Locals call it the skin stealer. Elwin said nothing. He just pulled the truck over to the side of the road and lit a cigarette, his hands still shaking. We never went back to his grandpa's cabin. I think we both knew that even though we killed it, there could be more of those things out there. More skin stealers hiding in the dark, waiting. The aftermath, well, things weren't the same with Elwyn after that. Some nights I still wake up in a cold sweat, thinking I hear something heavy thudding on my apartment roof. I check the locks, the windows, even though I'm ten stories up. City life isn't as safe as I always thought it was. I was headed down to Corpus Christi for the weekend. You know, beaches, beers, good times. I'm Clay, by the way. Had this old beater Honda I'd barely kept alive. Just enough to get me from my crummy apartment to my crummy job and back. Not usually much for long road trips, but sometimes a man just needs some surf and sunshine. Highway through South Texas is flat, let me tell you. Hours of it feeling the rumble through the busted seat right into my spine. Needed a change of scenery, so I veered off on one of those dinky farm roads. Figured it'd at least be a different sort of boring for a while. Sun was starting to set all gold and pink when I spotted this place up ahead. Honestly, a total dump to begin with. Cracked up pavement, barn half collapsed in on itself. But there was this big willow out front, branches hanging all the way to the ground like one of those spooky photos you see online. Had a niche for that kind of weirdness, so I pulled over. I was stretching my legs, listening to the cicadas going nuts, when this movement catches my eye. 
Deep in the shadows under that tree, I swear to you, there was something hunched over. At first, I thought it was just a big dog rooting in the dirt. I'm not one to freak out about stray critters. Then its head lifted, and it turned towards me. Now I'm not going to sit here and tell you I saw horns or glowing eyes or any of that horror movie junk. Because what was freaky was that it was just wrong. Proportions all skewed, limbs too long and twisty, loping like it had too many joints where they shouldn't be. The way its head sat on its neck was messed up, more hunched over than anything natural. I couldn't even make out a face under all that scraggly fur. Didn't need a second look to know something about that thing was plain unnatural. I bolted back to the Honda, fumbling the keys until I got the door open. Just as I slammed it shut, that creature scrambled out from under the tree a whole lot faster than its awkward build should have allowed. It was scrabbling around the car, clawed hands raking at the windows, and I swear, it was sniffing the air, like it was tracking my scent. See, I'm from rural Texas all right, no stranger to guns. Glove box had an old pistol, nothing fancy, just a little security blanket. I was trembling like a leaf, but I knew I had to get out of there. I jammed the thing in gear and floored it. In the rearview mirror, that creature was still there, scrabbling in the dirt I'd kicked up, loping with those impossible strides. Took another hour on those back roads before I felt okay enough to pull over. Hands were still shaking so bad I could hardly hold my phone. Called Ethan, my buddy from high school who lived out this way. Dude's a bit of a nut with all his conspiracy stuff but I needed someone who wasn't going to tell me I was crazy. Turns out, his place wasn't too far from where I was, like a stroke of luck after a seriously messed up day. When Ethan opened the door, I must have looked like a damn ghost because he dragged me inside without a word. He poured me something stiff, listened patiently while I babbled out the story. Ethan, bless him, didn't crack a smile didn't question a single detail. He just nodded, face real serious. Dude, you saw the low branch lurker, he said deadpan. That thing hunts around these parts. Locals mostly stay clear, but it snatches tourists sometimes. The low branch lurker? I sputtered. You've got to be joking. He shook his head. Nope. Stories go back generations. Reckon whatever it is, it lairs under old trees, especially willows. You're real lucky it didn't snatch you. We stayed up late into the night, Ethan rattling off all this lore, half whispered like he was worried the creature might be listening at the window. Turns out, the best protection against the lurker is cold iron. So, first light... We made an emergency run into town, picked up every bit of raw iron we could find at the pawn shops and hardware stores, nails, chains, old tools, whatever. Ethan's got one of those old farmhouse setups, the attic stuffed with all sorts of junk his family collected over the years. We spent hours hauling it all out, sorting through anything and everything metal. Must have looked like a couple of crackpots. I know it. But when the sun went down, that whole attic was festooned with iron. Spikes all along the rafters, chains crisscrossed over the windows. The place felt like a fortress. I don't know for sure if that thing tracked me back to Ethan's. Might have lost the trail, might have been deterred by all the metal. But some nights, when a wind kicks up, and I hear the old house creak, I swear I can still smell that musty, rank fur smell, just outside the window. I live in northern Nevada, just outside this tiny town called Red Bluff. It's one of those places so small most maps don't have it on there. 
Heck, it took me forever to adjust to life here. No movie theater, no mall. Nearest target is like a two-hour drive away. I'm Zeb, by the way. Nice to meet you. Anyway, all that quiet suits my girlfriend, Alara, down to the ground. She's an artist, and let me tell you, between the sunsets, the old mines dotting the hills, and those wild mustangs roaming around, plenty of inspiration out here. See, that's how I wound up stuck out at some godforsaken ghost town early this past Saturday. Come on, Zev, Elara begged. It'll be fun. I want to try some new sketches and it's way too crowded to work at home. Fun is a relative concept, you get me? But hey, happy wife, happy life. Well, not a wife yet, but still. We pulled off this dirt road, dust billowing behind us. The wind was howling, kicking up sand that stung like crazy. Elara, all excited, points out this cluster of crumbling buildings. I ain't gonna lie, the place gave me the creeps. Old wooden signs creaked on rusty chains, half-rotted doors rattled. You get the picture. Babe, this is literally asking for a horror movie to happen. I tell her, trying to lighten the mood. We'll be fine. She brushes me off, already setting up her easel and paints. Now, I'm no art buff, but Alara's got skills. While she got to work, I figured I'd explore. First building looked like an old saloon. Busted windows floor littered with broken bottles that glittered in the scant sunlight. I poked around, found a faded photo half-buried under debris. Two guys from, like, the 1800s dressed in those cowboy get-ups. One dude, tall, kinda goofy-looking, even in the rough pick. The other, something about his eyes, just staring straight out, sent shivers down my spine. Further exploration was less interesting. Same crumbling shacks, same creepy vibes. Sun starts to dip lower when I hear Alara call out, Zev! I think I got something amazing. Check this out. I hurry over and nearly drop my jaw. Even unfinished, her painting is incredible. Not just the detail, but the feeling, this sense of dread, like a storm about to break. And in the center, this figure half-hidden in shadow. Tall, lanky, way too skinny. I can't quite make out its face, but I swear there are eyes, like burning coals staring back from the canvas. I... I don't know, Alara. I say, trying not to sound too freaked out. Kinda gives me the willies. She laughs. That's the point, Zev. It's like this place, forgotten, but there's something still here. She starts stabbing paint again, adding these swirling patterns around the figure. This energy, she says, so raw, it calls to me. I want to argue, but she's in the zone, you know? So I figure, let her do her art thing, and I distract myself looking through the other buildings. That's when I find it, an old, leather-bound journal tucked in the back of what looked like an office. Curiosity wins out. Pages covered in this spidery handwriting, half faded, but I can make out references to the mind collapsing, then something about hunger, a darkness, bargains. Real hairs standing up on the back of your next stuff. Last entry, though, that was chilling. Guy talks about seeing lights out in the desert, some chanting, promises of power, and something about a payment. The handwriting just trails off, like whoever was writing got interrupted. My skin's crawling. I shove the journal back. Gotta tell Alara. Gotta convince her to get the heck out of Dodge. I head back, that swirling figure in her painting getting clearer, seeming to loom larger. And then I see it. Beyond my girlfriend, silhouetted against the blazing sunset, there's something standing on the hill. Just like she painted it, tall and impossibly thin, shadows stretched long. 
My heart's pounding like a drum, but my feet are frozen in place. Then, slowly, like it's turning its head, the figure seems to look directly at me. That's when Alara notices. Zev! What's wrong? She says, her voice laced with concern. I can't respond. I can only point, fear choking off the words. She spins around, sees the figure, and her eyes widen in alarm. Whatever she sees in its inhuman face mirrors my own terror. Suddenly, she whips out her palette knife, never thought I'd be so grateful for that thing, and slashes a bold X across the painting, destroying the creepy shadowy form with a defiant swipe. The figure on the hill doesn't disappear, but it flinches back, as if, wounded. That's when we run. I don't know if it's chasing us. I don't look back. We stumble through the desert, thorns tearing at our clothes, the wind screaming in our ears. Only when we reach the car, fumbling with keys, Alara clutching her ruined painting, do I dare glance towards the ghost town. The ghost town is nothing but a blur in the rearview mirror now. We're hurtling down the highway, gas pedal practically touching the floor. Alara hunches over in the passenger seat, her ruined painting clutched to her chest. I can't shake the image of that thing. I swear, when it flinched, those eyes burned like embers. I think I destroyed it, Alara whispers her voice barely above the whine of the engine. Destroyed what? My voice cracks, the terror still too fresh. I risk a quick glance in the mirror. Just miles of empty desert, nothing chasing us. Yet. I... I don't know, she stammers. But my painting, it was connected somehow. When I slashed it, I felt... She cuts herself off, tears glistening in the fading twilight. We drive through the night, headlights carving a path across the desolate landscape. The radio refuses to find a signal, just static echoing the pounding of my heart. We need a plan, a safe haven, but my mind's a blank. Hours later, sheer exhaustion forces us to stop in a crummy motel on the edge of some blink and you miss it town. The room's barely big enough for the bed, and the stained carpet makes my skin crawl. Alara collapses on the mattress, still in her dust-covered clothes, clutching the painting. I flick on the TV, the mindless chatter of late-night infomercials a pathetic attempt to ward off the heavy silence. As dawn breaks, I make a split-second decision. No more running. We need help answers back to Red Bluff. Home might not feel safe, but it's all we got. Alara doesn't put up a fight. She's drained, eyes dulled by a mix of fear and determination. It's a long drive back, punctuated by heavy silences and my occasional nervous glance in the rearview. When we finally pull into our driveway, the familiar sight is both a relief and a shock. I hesitate. We should call the cops, I say, trying to keep the tremble out of my voice. They won't believe us, Zev, Elara murmurs. They'll think we're crazy. She's right, damn it. How do you even describe what we saw? The mind, the journal. It sounds like a bad horror movie. But something tells me this ain't over. We grab what we can, Elara supplies some clothes, and that stupid, haunting painting. We lock the house up real good, then pile back into the car. Only, we ain't staying in town, no way. Remember that old hunting cabin my uncle has? The one up in the mountains barely gets cell reception? That's our new hideaway. I punch in the directions, and we take off again, this time heading towards the isolated peaks. The cabin's just as I remember, small, rustic, no frills. But there's firewood, some canned food, and blessed silence. As night falls, we sit by the flickering fireplace, 
shadows dancing across the warped wooden walls. We need to figure this out, Elara insists, her voice gaining some of its former strength. That thing, it's tied to this place. The journal, my painting, there's something in the history of Red Bluff. So we start digging. Not in dirt, but online. Turns out, Red Bluff had a string of vanishings years back, mostly miners, blamed on accidents or wild animals. Then we find the local legend, some old wives' tale whispered around campfires about a creature called the Long Walker, a gaunt trickster feeding on despair. Locals swore it was just a story to scare greenhorn miners. Do you think? Alara starts, but doesn't finish. We both know the answer. This thing, this long walker, whatever it is, is real, and somehow Alara's painting gave it a foothold. My gut twists in cold dread. We're sitting ducks in this isolated cabin. For the next few days, we're trapped in a bizarre limbo. We research like mad, desperate for any weakness, any folklore hinting at how to fight this thing. Turns out, nothing useful. We debate the painting, whether destroying it completely will break the connection. But what if it makes the long walker even angrier? The waiting is the worst. I pace until the floorboards creak, my gaze constantly flicking towards the impenetrable forest just beyond the windows. Every creak of wood, every rustle of the wind sounds like footsteps getting closer. We take turns sleeping always one of us on watch. Then, that fifth morning it comes. A silhouette detaches from the treeling. Tall, impossibly thin, just like in the painting. The long walker slowly approaches, its unnaturally long limbs moving like a spider's. I swear I hear a clicking sound, like branches snapping. My heart pounds against my ribs. In the cabin... Elara clutches the fireplace poker, the only makeshift weapon we have. Zev, she hisses. The painting! It led him here. We need to get rid of it. Panic and desperation claw at me, but she's right. I grab the accursed canvas. Outside, the long walker is barely a few yards away now, its shadowy form flickering closer. Hey, ugly! I yell, flinging open the cabin door and chucking the painting into the clearing. As it lands, the creature pauses, its head tilting with sickening curiosity. That's my chance. I sprint into the woods, adrenaline blurring my vision. Elara screams my name, but I ignore her. I gotta keep running, lead it away from her. My lungs feel like they're on fire as I tear through the underbrush branches whipping my face. I hear crashing behind me, heavy footfalls, but I don't dare look back. Hours blur into each other. I run until I collapse, gasping for breath. My legs feel like they're about to give out, but I force myself up. If I stop, it's over. The forest is getting thicker, the trees older, the air heavy with a strange, musty smell. Then I see it, a cave, its entrance concealed behind a curtain of vines. It's a desperate gamble, but right now, desperate is all I got. I duck inside, the sudden darkness blinding, the scent of damp earth and something, animalistic, assailing my nostrils. I hear the long walker crashing towards the cave. Panic surges again, but then a flicker of hope. Remember the stories? These creatures hate sunlight, their shadows given form. It's already late afternoon, it won't risk entering here. And I'm right. Just outside the cave mouth it stops. I hear a low, guttural growl, like a beast snarling in frustration. It paces those long, spindly limbs twitching. But it doesn't venture inside. Time stretches out into an agonizing blur. I shiver in the cold dampness, listening to the long walker's growls slowly fade, replaced by the settling quiet of dusk. 
when even the bird song stops, I know I'm safe for now at least. Exhausted to the bone, I crawl out of the cave, the first stars of twilight poking through the canopy overhead. I stumble, guided more by gut instinct than sight, until I catch a familiar glimmer, the outline of the cabin against the darkening sky. My heart lurches with relief and dread. Elara waits at the porch, her face a mask of strained worry and determination. She rushes towards me as I collapse, the strength finally leaving my body. We cling to each other, the sobs we'd held back so long shaking us both. We don't talk about the long walker, not yet. Instead, we gather wood, light a fire, eat some of the meager supplies. For the first time in days, a strange calm settles over us. We survive. The aftermath isn't some grand victory, no heroic final battle. It's long talks by the fading embers of the fire, piecing together scraps of lore. It's the weary realization that this might never stop, this creature might always be lurking, some forgotten horror clinging to the fringes of our world. And it's the decision we reach as the dawn breaks. We can't stay. Running, hiding, it's not a life. So we pack up, leave everything but the barest essentials. The cabin is abandoned, a haunt for whatever else might call these woods home. We hike out, heading, well, anywhere but here. City life beckons, the anonymity of crowds a strange kind of safety after all we've seen. Will it be enough to escape the long walker's shadow? Who knows? But right now, just putting miles between us feels like doing something, anything, rather than waiting helplessly for the inevitable. Maybe, maybe we'll be okay. Or maybe we'll always be glancing over our shoulders, waiting for the next time that tall, and possibly thin silhouette appears at the edge of our vision. I don't have answers, not anymore. But I got a Lara, and that, I guess, has to be enough for now. I work on a cattle ranch outside of Lavelle, Wyoming. We get the occasional tourist in the summer, but mostly it's just me and old man Yates. Even though it feels like the middle of nowhere, we still see folks now and then, ranchers passing through, folks heading up into the Bighorn Mountains, that kind of thing. It's why my first thought wasn't the worst when I spotted a figure hunched alongside Highway 14A last Monday night. Yatesy, that's what I call him, had headed into town for supplies the day before, so it just figured maybe his truck broke down again, that old clunker. I pulled over and hopped out, shouting his name. That heap of rags by the road didn't move. As I got closer, something seemed off. Too bulky to be Yatesy, even bundled up in a winter coat. Yatesy? I called out a little less certain now. Nothing. The wind whipped up, and that heap turned, lifting its head. I stumbled back, my breath snagging in my chest. This thing, it wasn't human. Beneath a ratty mass of hair, two eyes glittered like black marbles. Its skin stretched tight over bone, almost translucent. It had a mouth, I saw that as it opened and let out a rasp I'll never forget. I turned and sprinted for the truck. I fumbled the damn keys, my hands shaking something fierce. It scrambled after me, moving way too fast for its lanky frame. Thank God the engine finally sputtered to life. Tires squealing, I threw the truck in reverse. It lunged, its hand smacking against the passenger window with a wet thud. I stomped the gas and took off, gravel flying. I didn't look in the rear view until miles later. The road was empty, just the headlights cutting through the endless dark. But that wasn't the thing that got me rattled most, no. It was the fact that the side mirror on the passenger door was cracked. It was impossible— 
something that skinny, that weak looking, but I'd heard the smack, so clear it cut right through the revving engine. For a few days, I jumped at every shadow. Yatesy still hadn't gotten back, though I figured the truck must have died on him. No cell service out there for help. But Friday night, I swore I saw that shape again, skittering near the corral. I grabbed my rifle, that old point thirty dash zero six my grandpa left me, and aimed. But when the beam of my flashlight hit the spot, nothing. Maybe just my eyes playing tricks. Still, I slept with the rifle loaded beside me that night. I was headed down to Lovell the next morning to search for Yatesy. I still hadn't shaken the unease that coiled in my gut. Just as I turned off the ranch road, I saw it, a flash of matted fur bolting across the highway. I slammed on the brakes, the truck skidding. Son of a... I muttered, staring out at the vast expanse of scrubland. It was gone, vanished into thin air. I rolled into Lovell and spotted a deputy's car parked at Maisie's diner. I figured maybe he had some news about Yates. When I pushed through the door, Deputy Owen sat in a booth, his brow creased and a coffee mug steaming untouched. Morning, Amen, he said. His voice had a strange edge to it. Take a seat, will ya? I sat down, my stomach sinking. You got news about Yatesy? No. Well, not exactly, Owens replied. Look, Eamon, there's been some funny things happening around here. Strange sightings, folks disappearing. His eyes met mine. You seen anything unusual? I hesitated. The image of that, that creature, its inhuman eyes, flashed before me. Nothing specific. I finally answered. That was half a lie, but I didn't want to sound crazy. Owen sighed. Couple days ago, folks found some cattle carcasses over by the highway. Ripped open, like some kind of wild beast scat to him, but no tracks, no scat, nothing, he said. Now, the ranchers are riled up, talking about a Bigfoot or some such nonsense. The hairs on my neck stood on end. Cattle, right near where I saw that thing. But Bigfoot? That was just a story, right? I asked Owens what they planned to do about this, and he said they were setting up some patrols, sending out a warning to local ranchers. I felt a chill run down my spine. Leaving the diner, I saw Maisie through the window, her usual cheerful face looking drawn and scared. That fear gnawed at me. Something was out there. Something ain't right at all. And now, even the town folks felt it. My gut twisted. This wasn't just about old Yatesy anymore. The drive back to the ranch was torture. I kept thinking about Yatesy, about what that thing might have done to him. Was he still out there, alive, or was it too late? My chest tightened until it felt like I could barely breathe. I had to find him. Had to do something. I parked the truck, grabbed the rifle, and headed into the hills on foot. My heart pounded in my ears. If I ran into that thing again, I wouldn't hesitate. I knew it sounds crazy, but it was either him or me. Dusk descended fast. I scanned the landscape. Any flicker of movement sent a jolt of panic through me. Then I saw it, Yatesy's truck, upturned and half-submerged in the little creek that winds through the ranch. My stomach clenched. I knew he couldn't have survived a crash that bad. But there were no tracks around the wreck, just mud churned up where something had been dragged away. I followed the faint trail, my pulse throbbing in my head. That familiar rasping echoed in the distance, chilling me to the bone. I crept towards the sound, peering into the dense thicket. That's when I saw it, hunched over a shape, its bony claws ripping gruesomely. Yatesy. At least, what was left of him. 
A primal fury surged through me. I raised the rifle and aimed, my hand steady. The creature whipped its head around, eyes burning. I squeezed the trigger, and the gunshot echoed in the sudden silence. It let out a guttural screech, doubling over. I took aim again. Pop, pop. The creature jerked, then slumped to the ground. I approached cautiously. In the fading light, I realized its grotesque form. Its skin wasn't translucent, but covered in thin, wiry scales. Its mouth was a gaping maw lined with needle-like teeth. A shiver of disgust ran through me. Had to make sure this thing was truly dead. A final shot, right between those glittering eyes. Relief warred with nausea as I stumbled back. When the adrenaline started to fade, I realized what had to be done. I couldn't let anyone find Yatesy like this, and I sure wasn't leaving that, that beast-like thing for anyone else to stumble across. The next few hours were a haze. Somehow, I dragged both bodies down towards the creek bed, found a deep, eroded gully, and covered them with rocks and dirt. Back at the ranch, I lit a huge bonfire and fed it everything I could, old clothes, extra blankets, some of that rancid jerky Yatesy always swore by. I watched until the flames died down, leaving behind ash scattering in the morning wind. When the deputies showed up later, responding to the shots I'd reported, I told them a story, a desperate fight with a mountain lion that had dragged Yatesy off. They nodded sympathetically. They'd seen the cattle mutilations, knew things weren't normal out here anymore. I couldn't let the truth out, but I couldn't stay there. Days later, I packed what little I owned into my truck and headed out. No note, no goodbyes, just the open road ahead. It's funny how you never really appreciate something until it's gone. I missed that lonely ranch, damn near missed old Yatesy himself. Some nights, I still wake up in a cold sweat, hearing that ragged breathing, seeing those soulless black eyes. The folks down in the next town over, they've started whispering about a high behind, a creature from old stories said to stalk the woods. And every time I hear it, a shiver runs down my spine. Because some things, maybe they don't die as easily as we'd like. And I swear sometimes, when I'm driving down a long stretch of empty highway and the setting sun paints the land an eerie shade of red, I think I see a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye. Something lanky, something hungry, lurking just out of sight. I live in Elkhart, Indiana. Not exactly a hot spot for anything thrilling, but hey, the cost of living is good. Plus, RVs are big business here. Guess that's kinda interesting, in a motorhome enthusiast kind of way. Me? I'm Finian, and I do freelance IT work for some of the smaller manufacturers in town. The pay's decent, the hours suck, but it keeps me off the streets. Okay, so maybe I wasn't being totally honest about the thrills thing. This past week? Let's just say Elkhart got a whole lot more exciting. It started Monday and yeah, I know people hate Mondays, but this was next level. I'm down in the basement workshop of Tillman RVs cursing at a dead server. The owner, old man Tillman, he's the type who still believes in physical backups. Whatever, the guy pays me. As I'm glaring at the pile of metal, the power cuts out. Pitch black, tools clattering on the floor. You get the picture. Then, complete silence. You know that kind of quiet that's so thick it makes your ears ring? I stumble through the dark, swearing louder than any preacher would like, finally reaching the basement door. Yank it open, expecting the usual hum of the factory. Nothing. Not even a backup generator kicking in. 
That's when the screaming started. High-pitched, almost animalistic, echoing through the warehouse. My first thought is, someone's trapped on a machine, some freak industrial accident, you know? So I'm blundering back towards the sound, hands outstretched like some kind of budget Batman, half expecting to get soaked in oil or something equally disgusting. The warehouse is huge, one of those cavernous spaces littered with half-built RVs. I'm creeping between two monstrosities, thinking, okay, this is how I die in a horror movie, when the screaming stops just as abruptly as it started. In its place, I hear this wet, squelching noise. Hard to describe, but it's coming from nearby. Now I may do stupid things, but I'm not an idiot. I retreat slowly, feeling my way back to the basement door. Just as I reach the sanctuary of artificial light, it happens again. A shriek tears through the dark, closer this time. Whatever's out there, it's on the move. Heart pounding like a drum solo, I slam the door, shoving a workbench against it for good measure. Now I'm no stranger to long nights hunched over computers. But this is different. The darkness feels heavy, oppressive, like it has a physical presence. And that goddamn noise keeps popping up, getting closer, then trailing off, then somewhere else entirely. I'm hunkered down by the flickering server, thinking maybe there's a bat trapped in the ventilation. You know, rational explanations and everything. I grab a busted flashlight, figure at least I'll have a fighting chance against a glorified pigeon. Just as I flick it on, movement catches my eye. It's huge, a long, dark shape crouched atop one of the unfinished RVs. At first, I think my exhausted brain is playing tricks on me, but then it turns its head. Two pinpricks of light, I'm talking glow-stick light, not natural eyes, fixate on me in the beam. My brain does this weird short-circuit thing, like it can't reconcile what it's seeing. It's massive, sleek, and completely silent. The fur, if you could even call it that, it ripples like dark water. In a blink, it's gone. I skin the warehouse, hard hammering, but there's nothing. No rustling, no movement. Only those damn pinprick eyes fading in my memory. I convince myself it's distress, lack of sleep, maybe a gas leak making me hallucinate. Yeah, that must be it. By dawn... I haven't fixed a damn thing, and the power's still out. Old man Tillman wanders down, muttering about a blown transformer, nothing unusual. Except the whole time, those eyes are in the back of my head. When I finally leave, the sun's blindingly bright after that basement, and I do that nervous neck-twisting you see in cheesy thrillers, looking over my shoulder every two steps to the parking lot. Tuesday, same deal at a different RV place, this one family-owned. Same inexplicable power cut, same screams like someone's getting flayed alive, same, whatever that was in the dark. The owner gives me the stink eye, like it's my fault the lights went out. After that, the week blurs. Every workshop, every flickering computer screen, it feels like it's watching me. It's not until Thursday that I snap. I'm fixing some glitchy software at one of the bigger factories, when I see it again. This time, it's in broad daylight. Leaping between half-constructed trailers, so quick it's practically a blur. The workers are oblivious, hammering and welding, but I swear their foreman twitches, throws a glance over his shoulder like he senses something too. I ditch the job, drive like a madman, and spend the rest of the day holed up in my apartment. For the first time in a long, long time, I lock every door and window, pull the blinds, and just wait. Because I know, whatever that thing is, it's found me. Night falls, and even with every light blazing, the shadows stretch long and menacing. I hear a scratching at my balcony door like claws on the fiberglass. 
My hand freezes inches from the doorknob. It'll be waiting, I know that in my bones. But I also know I can't stay holed up here forever. My phone buzzes. It's a text from Vanessa, a co-worker, asking if I'm okay. Heard there were power issues across town. The normalcy of her message slams me back to reality. I can't tell her about the glowing eyes or the damn screeching, not unless I want to end up wearing some fancy white jacket with extra buckles. Instead, I text back a vague excuse, hands shaking so hard the phone nearly flies across the room. Something slams into the balcony door. Glass shatters, showering the carpet. It screeches again, this raw, echoing howl that sets my teeth on edge. I'm on autopilot now, shoving the couch across the room, blocking the shattered window. The balcony's small, thank God, so it's barricaded in minutes. But my apartment is on the third floor, and I don't even want to imagine how that thing climbs. Adrenaline surges, then ebbs, leaving me shaky and weak. That's when I notice the blood. Not a lot, just a smear on the broken glass. It hisses, and I realize it's steaming like acid. My mind spins, trying to make sense of fur like liquid darkness, of glowing eyes, of blood that melts glass. Folklore flickers back into my brain, old monster stories I'd always dismissed. There's one, half-forgotten, about a creature called a scarpa. A hunter from the shadows, acid for blood, eyes that shine in the dark. It fits. Fear curdles into something hard and resolute. Whatever this scarpa thing is, its flesh and blood may be bone too. Killable. I swipe open my web browser, fingers flying across the keyboard, searching for whatever scant scraps of lore I can find. By nightfall, I have a plan, stupid, probably suicidal, but it's all I've got. I stuff a backpack with supplies, rope, a first aid kit, my sturdiest kitchen knife. And the piece de resistance? A bottle of drain cleaner, the industrial strength junk. From what I've gleaned, Scarpa blood is its greatest weapon and weakness. If I can get close enough, coat the creature in the cleaner, yeah, it'll burn like hell, but maybe enough to give me an edge. As the last traces of light fade, I slip out through my bedroom window. The fire escape ladder creaks and groans, begging to give way under my weight. On the ground, shadows coalesce in strange shapes, every tree trunk and parked car morphing into monstrous forms. I force myself to move, following the half-remembered trail towards a big swathe of woods on the edge of town. Supposedly, the Scarpa prefers wild spaces. By the time I reach the trees, the moon is a pale sliver against the ink-black sky. Every snap of a twig underfoot, every rustle of the wind through leaves makes me flinch. It's not until I reach a small, overgrown clearing that I sense its presence. The air crackles, the silence a tangible thing. In the darkness, its eyes flare, twin beacons fixed on me. The scarper drops from a branch, slinking silently towards me. It's smaller than I imagined, maybe the size of a large dog, but lean and impossibly sleek. It moves in liquid bursts, circling me, a predator sizing up its prey. This is it. My heart thunders, drowning out the rustling leaves. Tightening my grip on the knife, I try the element of surprise, lunging towards it with a desperate yell. The scarpa screeches, twisting away with inhuman speed. I stumble, nearly falling to my knees. But it's enough, distraction. I rip open the drain cleaner, flinging the contents at the beast. It howls, a bubbling, guttural sound as the fumes sizzle its fur. There's a flicker of movement in the dark, then a thud. The smell hits me next, burning hair, acid, something rotten to the core. 
Through watering eyes I see the scarpa slumped on the ground, patches of its midnight fur bubbling and steaming. Its glowing eyes narrow, filled with a malevolence that chills me more than any monstrous appearance could. I raise the knife. This could be the end. It could lunge again, too fast for me to react. I could end up as just another half-eaten corpse lost in the woods, a forgotten victim of some nameless folklore creature. But instead, with a final, whimpering hiss, the scarpa melts back into the undergrowth. Its eyes fade last, two dwindling embers vanishing into the night. I collapse, breath rasping, chest aching. I sit there, under the indifferent stars, until the first fingers of dawn paint the sky. The police don't believe me. They find the scorch marks in the clearing, the bottle of cleaner, even specks of some unidentifiable blood. But no scarpa, no creature of the night. Just a guy who lost it and went berserk in the woods. Vanessa visits, concern etched on her face. I tell her some vague story about a wild animal, keep it simple enough for her to nod, smile, and then move on with her life. And me? Well, I keep an eye on the shadows, flinch at every nighttime noise. Now and then, I think I catch a gleam in the darkness, twin pinpricks of malevolent green, but they always vanish in the blink of an eye. Maybe the scarpa is gone. Maybe it's just my imagination getting the better of me. But deep down, I know. It's out there. Waiting. I remember last fall my sister, Maeve, and I decided to camp in the Angeles National Forest. Maeve's always been the outdoorsy one, me? I'm happier with a coffee and my laptop. But I figured, what the hell, a weekend unplugged might do me good. She wanted to challenge herself with a longer off-grid trail, so naturally I agreed since that's what great siblings do, right? We left L.A. Friday afternoon, the old Subaru packed with gear, and drove into the mountains. We found a turnout just as the sun started to dip, and Maeve decided that was our spot. I'd always thought trailheads were better, but hey, less work for me. We ate some sandwiches, set up the tent, and were ready to chill. Naturally, Maeve decided we should do a short sunset hike first. I won't lie, that sunset was gorgeous. The sky ablaze over the ridges, this weird silence that only hits you deep in the woods. It was something else. Then things got unsettling. It wasn't just the dark settling in, though I'm no fan of that. It was the feeling, you know? Like that prickled down your spine when you know something's off. Maybe we should head back? I tried to sound casual. Nah, scaredy cat, Maeve teased. It's the wild calling you, Kai. The wild can call all at once, I ain't answering. I mumbled. But we kept walking. There was this narrow section, and we heard a cracking sound, like a big branch snapping. We both froze. Wild boar? I whispered. Maeve, with her usual bravado, just shrugged and kept going. I was right behind her when it happened. The smell hit first, like rot, but with this sharp metallic tang to it. Then came the sound. It wasn't a growl, more like, well, like someone gargling with gravel. We both turned, and there it was. At least ten feet tall, hunched over with these long limbs that dragged on the ground. Lanky as hell, with skin so pale and mottled it could have been peeling paint. That head, like a human skull, way too big for the skinny neck and all teeth, rows and rows of them. If its eyes glowed, I didn't see it, but that thing didn't need eyes to know we were there. I don't recall screaming, just this cold shock that turned my legs to jelly. But Maeve, Maeve grabbed my arm and yanked. 
Pure instinct took over, and we ran. Branches whipped our faces, rocks ripped at our shoes, we just ran blind. Tripped, fell, got up, and ran again. The thing was behind us. Not that I looked, but you feel it. Like a hot breath on your neck that isn't really there. Then Maeve screamed, not a scared scream, a pained scream. I turned and saw her on the ground, clutching her leg. Go! She yelled. Kai, go! She tried to crawl back towards me, but the thing was there, impossibly fast. It was all sinewy arms and snapping teeth reaching for her, and Maeve was just screaming. It lunged, and she twisted the wrong way, and I heard a crack that didn't sound like any broken bone should. I don't know how I ran. I remember crashing into the tent, scrambling for my phone. No signal, of course. No car keys either may have had them. And out there, those noises, tearing, crunching, wet sounds I'll never unhear. I think what saved me was the flashlight. My trembling hands grabbed it, pure desperation. One stupid swipe, and it hit that thing square on. It jerked back, letting out a screech that split the night air. I fumbled around, got the car keys, found the horn, and blasted like my life depended on it. The noises slowed, and then stopped. I kept hitting that horn, tears all over my face, until I couldn't do it anymore. Silence. Just the echo of the horn and my ragged breathing. I huddled in that flimsy tent, the Subaru useless yards away, for what felt like forever. Somehow, I must have drifted off, because I woke up shaking, with the morning sun filtering through the ripped tent flap. And then, I saw the drag marks. It was like something heavy had been pulled through the dirt, straight away from the campsite. And blood, so much blood. I don't know how I didn't vomit. Instead, I somehow got myself together, crawled to the car, and just drove. Drove till I hit pavement and cell service, then called the rangers, the cops, anyone who would listen. They never found Maeve. No body, no real evidence of anything, to be honest. They gave me the usual spiel, accidents happen, animal attack, blah blah. And maybe, maybe that's what it was. But something in me just knew, deep down, it wasn't over. The aftermath was expected, I guess. They questioned me, searched the area, put my face on the news. Missing woman, possible foul play, usual stuff. I moved back in with my parents, went through the motions of therapy, tried to block it all out. Nights were the worst. Every shadow, every creak... I jolt awake, the smell of rot and blood heavy in my nostrils. That's when the nightmares started. Not about that night, not exactly. It was always the same, me running through the woods, the thing chasing, but I wasn't myself. I was Maeve. And in these dreams, I could see the thing clearly, that twisted skull, the hunger in those empty sockets. I could feel its breath on my neck, the rasp of its claws against my skin. After a few months, I couldn't take it anymore. The city was suffocating. I sold everything except my laptop, filled the gas tank, and just drove north. Needed to get away from people, from questions, from civilization. Ended up in some small town in Oregon, whitressing and living in a rundown motel. It wasn't great, but it was quiet. Then the clippings started showing up in local papers. Missing hikers, campers, hunters, all in the nearby forest. Some showed signs of animal attack, but others, others were just gone, vanished without a trace. And I knew, even though I'd never admitted out loud, those deaths were on me. It became an obsession. I spent every spare moment at the library, scouring online forums, old news articles. 
anything that felt connected. There were whispers of an ancient Native American legend about a creature they called the Tekelma, a starved spirit, twisted and bound to the woods, always hunting. It didn't perfectly match what I saw, but it was close. Close enough. One night I found it. An old blog entry by some hiker, talking about exploring abandoned cabins in the woods and hearing a terrible screeching. At the bottom, a grainy cell phone photo. It was blurry, just a shape in the shadows, but that long, spindly body and huge head was unmistakable. It was dated two weeks before my camping trip. I got up and checked a map. The hiker's location lined up perfectly with where Maeve and I parked. It wasn't coincidence. This thing had a territory. And I had to end it. I packed a bag, flashlight, knife, pepper spray, my dad's old hunting rifle that I'd never even fired before. Locals gave me a weird look when I bought heavy-duty rope and traps at the hardware store, but I didn't care. The next day, I drove out there, found a spot just inside the tree line, and started setting up. It was hard waiting. The forest felt too alive at night, every rustle a potential threat. But my fear was overshadowed by rage now, a cold, burning anger I barely recognized as my own. Finally, there it was. That same stench of rot, and the thing stepped out of the darkness. Taller than I remembered, each movement jittery and twitching, like a puppet pulled by an unseeing force. It was focused on the traps, not me. When it stepped into the snare, I hauled on the rope, yanking its leg out from under it. It roared and thrashed, and I fired at it, hitting one of the spindly arms. The creature shrieked like nothing I'd ever heard, a sound that echoed through the emptiness inside me. It scrambled, trying to untangle itself, and I was on it, rifle abandoned, knife in hand. We fought like hell. It was strong, stronger than it should have been, those thin arms whipping me hard enough to send me sprawling. But I was fueled by something primal, something beyond fear. I stabbed it, again and again, the blood hot on my hands. Each blow fueled by every lost person, every scream, and most of all, for Maeve. Finally, it stopped moving. It lay there, a mangled mess, that huge head twisted at an impossible angle amidst the leaves. I stared at it for a long time, unable to process what had just happened. Then exhaustion hit, and all I could do was collapse beside it and cry. I don't know how I got back to my car or to my motel. I don't even remember if I packed. All I know is that next morning I was on the road again, driving into the sunrise. The Tekelma is dead. Maybe for good, maybe just for now. But I'll keep driving, keep looking over my shoulder, ready for the next whisper, the next sign of it, or something else waiting in the dark. Because now, I'm the hunter. I live in northern Nevada, just outside this tiny town called Red Bluff. It's one of those places so small most maps don't have it on there. Hell, even Google Maps has nothing more than a dot, so you can imagine it doesn't draw a lot of attention. Mostly ranches, some farms, and just enough folks to keep a general store in business. It's quiet. Peaceful. Perfect if you're like me and tired of the fast lane. My name's Killian, by the way. Killian Hayes. I used to be a tech guy in San Francisco. That seems like a lifetime ago, though. Now I spend most of my days tending to the chickens, puttering around the property, and trying to convince my neighbor, Eloise, to teach me how to knit. She finds that request endlessly hilarious because I'm a six-foot-tall, ex-military dude with hands like hams, 
not very knitting friendly. Anyway, last weekend something, well, something ain't right, you know? Things always have a way of feeling off before they go full-blown sideways. It started with the chickens. You wouldn't think hens could tell something's wrong, but believe me, they can. Started refusing to go into the coop at night, got to the point where I had to pick him up one by one and tuck them in. And well, that ain't natural behavior. Something was giving them the heebie-jeebies, that's for sure. Same time this started happening, Eloise mentioned that her sheep were acting skittish, too. That's the thing about small towns. News gets around, even if it's just old folks gossiping about livestock going squirrely. I don't believe in all that paranormal hooey, so I was trying to figure out what could actually be bothering everyone's animals. Figured maybe we had a new predator around, coyote, maybe even a stray mountain lion. But here's the thing, even with a predator, critters don't react like mine were. It was more like that low-level, bone-deep fear they get, not just simple skittishness. Then, two nights back, that fear started hitting me too. It started off real subtle, like when your gut clenches for no reason walking down a dark street. Then it turned into a constant low-level hum in the back of my head. Every time I went outside, I got the feeling I was being watched. Like eyes boring into me from somewhere in the trees. Wasn't no wild animal, that's for sure. Whatever was doing the watching felt smart. I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. Like it was sizing me up, calculating, but not in a hungry way more curious. That night, I doubled down on security. I've got some decent training, and even out here in the sticks, I keep a shotgun handy. Did a property check, set some extra motion lights, and tried to ignore the creeping dread that something was out there. I managed to doze off around 2, maybe 3 a.m. Then the sound woke me up, blood-curdling screaming coming from Eloise's place. That woman can holler to wake the dead, but this, this was something else. Pure terror. I stumbled out of bed and grabbed the shotgun before I was even fully awake. My old instincts kicking in made me toss on a pair of boots, but I still ran out barefoot as fast as I could. Eloise's house is only a few hundred yards down the lane, and I was there in a heartbeat that prickling feeling on my neck getting worse with every step. Her porch light was on, but there was no sign of Eloise. Just that gut-wrenching silence, even worse than the screaming had been. I eased inside, shotgun at the ready. Living room was empty, the furniture overturned like a bar brawl had happened. Kitchen and bathroom were clear, too. I headed outside heart pounding so hard I thought it had burst. Her barn door was hanging half off its hinges, and that's where I saw them. Her sheep. Or what was left of them. Animals don't get torn apart like that. It's not how predators work, not even the big ones. They were shredded, parts missing, bones sticking out at impossible angles. It looked like an explosion had gone off inside that barn. And the smell. Lord, I think I puked a little. I managed to find some tracks in the dirt, but nothing I recognized. They were huge, each toe the size of my fist. Not paws, not hooves, more like stubby fingers, or claws that could retract, if that makes sense. Then I heard a rustling behind me. Whipped around, shotgun up, but my brain couldn't process what I saw fast enough. This thing, because it sure as hell wasn't a person, dropped down from where it had been clinging to the rafters of the barn. Bigger than anything I've ever seen, easily eight feet tall. Covered in coarse, grayish fur, not like any bear or animal I recognized. Its arms were freakishly long, almost dragging on the ground, and the hands, well, hands ain't the right word. More like hooked claws, 
each one as long as my forearm. There was way too much space between its legs, like its lower body didn't fit with the top, like a giant spider perched up on two legs. And the head, its head was just wrong, barely had a muzzle, almost flat-faced, except for a long, bony protrusion coming out of its forehead. I couldn't make out a proper mouth, but I saw teeth, rows and rows of them, serrated and gleaming in the moonlight. The thing just stood there, swaying slightly, like it wasn't used to being upright, those eyes fixed right on me. They were milky yellow, like a blind animal's, but filled with this cold intelligence that made my stomach drop. Before I could get a shot off, it twitched, like the whole thing was a giant puppet being jerked on a string. It scuttled back into the shadows of the barn on all fours and bolted out into the night, fast as a damn horse. The only sound left was that buzzing in my head, that feeling of wrongness. I knew it was still out there, watching me. I called the sheriff, but of course, they thought I was drunk, or seeing things. But I know what I saw, and I know it's coming back. I'm not leaving Eloise out there alone, and I damn sure ain't letting it get to my chickens. The rest of that night was a blur. The sheriff finally showed up, just before dawn, with the backup finally called in from Reno. Took one look at the barn, the mess inside, and stopped treating me like some kook. His deputies fanned out, searching the property with me and Eloise, who was a wreck, bless her heart. We didn't find any sign of the creature. Whatever it was, it had vanished as quickly as it came. But something in me knew that didn't mean it was gone for good. It was out there, lurking. The news spread through town like wildfire. Folks who used to laugh at my paranoia were suddenly toting guns and checking their locks twice. Farmers brought their livestock in at night, and I heard one of the old-timers muttering something about it being a skunk ape, but that sounded like pure hogwash to me. See, I served in Afghanistan. Saw plenty of stuff that doesn't make sense, things folks back home wouldn't believe. This creature... It put me on edge, like being back in a combat zone. Something about its movements, the way it carried itself, this wasn't some mutated animal or local legend. It was a hunter. Smart. Strategic. Over the next few days, I hardly slept, kept thinking I'd catch a glimpse of those yellow eyes in the shadows. It was like all my military training had kicked back into gear. Every sound made me jump, didn't matter if it was a branch creaking or a bird flapping its wings. I was a walking coil of tension, fueled by coffee and adrenaline. The town practically shut down. No one dared leave their homes after dark, and kids stayed indoors, even in broad daylight. The sheriff set up patrols, but we all knew it wouldn't be enough. This thing, it was too cunning. Then came the second attack. Two nights ago. Hit Hank's farm. He kept a couple of dogs, mean as junkyard mutts, but they never even barked. Hank and his wife were gone. No bodies, just a whole lot of blood and some of those same weird tracks. The sheriff started talking, evacuation then. It felt like a punch in the gut. My property, the animals... Eloise, leaving wasn't an option. I told the sheriff as much, said I'd be damned if I let some, some monster drive me from my home. He just gave me that tired, pitying look they all shared now. That afternoon, I went out and bought everything the hardware store had, traps, trip wire, searchlights, you name it. Turned my property into a fortress loaded up on enough ammo I could hold off a small army. Figured whatever that thing was, if it wanted in, it would have to get through me first. I haven't seen Eloise for a couple of days. I'm too scared to go search for her, 
but I have a sinking feeling deep down. The night is deathly quiet. My heart is pounding so hard I can hardly breathe. My ears strain with every little rustle in the bushes. I'm sitting in the kitchen, gun across my lap, staring out the window. I swear I saw something move a few minutes ago. It knows I'm here. It's toying with me, playing some twisted game. I know it's coming, that's for sure. I can feel it in my bones. Maybe it wants revenge for Eloise, for the sheep. Or maybe this whole damn thing is about territory, and I'm next. My mouth is dry, and I feel a headache starting to pound behind my eyes. I wonder if Hank felt like this. It feels so pointless to resist. Whatever that thing is, it's stronger than me, smarter than me. It's pure survival out there now, predator and prey, and I'm the damn prey. Wait. There's a flicker of yellow at the edge of the orchard. Oh God, it's close. Closer than it's ever been. I raise my gun. It's barely more than a shadow, distorted by the moonlight, but I can see that bone-like horn, those long, spidery arms. God help me. I steady my breathing. My pulse is hammering against my hands. It's creeping forward now, that eerie sway to its movements. It knows I see it, but it's not rushing. It's savoring this. I squeeze the trigger. Maybe I'm calling it a strix. It's the closest word I can think of for that monstrous owl-like thing. The shot rings out, shattering the silence. It hits its mark. I saw the strix flinch, the bullet ripping through its shoulder, maybe even shattering bone. It lets out a screech, more like a wounded animal than anything I've ever heard before, and staggers back a step. I don't hesitate, pumping the shotgun and firing again. This time I hit it in the chest. It stumbles, but damn, the thing doesn't fall. Those yellow eyes burn brighter, like it's pissed, not really hurt. A third shot, straight at that bony horn. It ducks, so I miss, and before I can chamber another round, the Strix is scrambling towards the tree line. For something so big, it moves damn fast. I see it leap into the shadows, vanishing into the darkness of the orchard. My hands are shaking so badly I drop the gun. My chest feels like it's going to cave in, each breath a ragged sob. But damn, I did it. I heard it. Maybe even drove it off for good. I stagger to my feet and head inside. I need to find Eloise, check on her, make sure she's okay after what happened with the Strix. And then, well, I don't know what comes after. I'm too tired to think past the next hour. I grab a flashlight and my keys, ready to head next door. Then I hear it. A scratching sound, like nails against glass. It's coming from the upstairs bedroom window. I freeze, every muscle in my body going rigid. No, no, it can't be. The scratching intensifies. There's a thud, something heavy landing on the roof. I slowly turn, my heart pounding a deafening rhythm in my ears. And there it is. The Strix. Crouched on the roof, its yellow eyes blazing through the darkness. It's got blood on its muzzle, its chest ragged from my gunshots. It tilts its head, a grotesque parody of a curious bird and opens its mouth in a silent snarl. I stumble backwards, tripping over the discarded shotgun. The keys slip from my numb fingers. The Strix unfolds itself, its body impossibly long as it stands upright. I hear a sickening crack, like bones snapping into place, and it raises a clawed hand. It knows. It knows I heard it, drove it away from its prey. Now it's here for payback. I scramble for the gun, my fingers fumbling on the cold metal. But the Strix is too fast. With a flicker of movement, 
it launches itself toward me. The impact knocks me off my feet, my head smacking against the concrete. Pain explodes in my skull. I try to fight back, but the world is spinning, my vision blurred. The Strix lowers its head, those serrated teeth flashing. I can smell its breath, hot and rancid. It's going for my throat, going for the kill. I shut my eyes, brace myself, but the killing blow never comes. Instead, I hear a piercing scream, high-pitched and inhuman. The weight on my chest vanishes, and I hear the sound of claws scrabbling on the porch followed by a heavy thud as the Strix jumps back onto the roof. Then, another sound, footsteps, pounding towards the house. Eloise. Killian! Oh my God! She bursts into the light of the porch, a tremblingness, but in her hands, her hands are clutching my old military axe. The blade is covered in something dark and glistening. Eloise tiny, frail Eloise, who's scared of her own shadow. She just faced down the monster that had turned our little town inside out. I... I saw it come in the window, she stammers, her voice hoarse. I didn't know what to do, but... but the axe was there, and... Then, as if remembering I'm lying there dazed in the dirt, she drops it and runs over to me. She fusses over me, checking for injuries, and all I can do is stare up at her while the adrenaline courses through my veins. When the sheriff and the rest of the posse arrive ten minutes later, we tell our story. They find the Strix's body behind the house. Seems Eloise didn't just startle it, she damn near split its skull open. The aftermath, well, it ain't pretty. Turns out, those weren't the only Strix in the world. We heard reports over the next few weeks. Similar attacks in other small towns, folks vanishing, tracks and sightings just like ours. Life in Red Bluff didn't go back to normal. It couldn't, not after that. There's a new kind of fear settled over us. But there's defiance too, a bone-deep stubbornness. Eloise and I, along with the folks who decided to stay, we started organizing. We watch for signs, patrol the area, stock up on supplies. It feels like the whole town is holding its breath, waiting for the other shoe to drop. As for me, well, I'm not leaving. This place is my home, and if those things think they can drive us off our land, they got another thing coming. I live in Helena, Montana, or at least I did before, well, before all this. Helena's one of those places people don't move to, they just kinda end up here through some weird turn of fate. Me? I was part of a traveling construction crew, got separated after a job up in Wyoming went belly up. Had just enough for gas to get me here and a little put away for a cheap apartment. Funny how one minute you're just going through the motions, and the next, your world flips upside down in the middle of a damn Tuesday. I guess that's just how life is out here on the fringe of civilization. Anyway, so I'm settling in, getting to know the regulars at the Greasy Spoon downtown, shout out to Dottie, she makes the best damn pie in the state, when I hear about this place out in the sticks. Supposed to be beautiful untouched woods, pristine lake, the whole nine yards. Some folks even whispered about old logging trails you could hike for miles without seeing another soul. Seemed like my kind of place, especially after breathing exhaust fumes for weeks on end. It was late August, but the weather was still holding up, so I figured, why the hell not? Packed up my truck that Saturday morning just some water, snacks, decent boots, that sort of thing. Figured it wouldn't be more than a few hours in and out. Now, I should mention my buddy Rowan is the kind of guy who'd buy a satellite phone just to make a grocery run. 
complete opposite of me, which is probably why we get along so well. But this time, even he'd raised an eyebrow, guest cell service that far out was pretty much non-existent. Didn't really think anything of it, though. The place was easy enough to find, even with the cruddy directions I'd gotten at the diner. Gravel road turning off the highway, and then it was just miles of trees and more trees. I'm no stranger to the wilderness, but even I was getting a little turned around after a while. Finally, though, I pull into this clearing, not much, really, just some flattened earth and a couple of abandoned fire pits. Figured this must have been where folks camped before heading out. Left my truck there, and started walking the way I figured one of the trails had to be. First hour or so is fine, just me, the sound of birds, and that sweet smell of pine needles. Pretty relaxing, all in all, and I was starting to see why folks talked this place up. But that's when things got weird. First, it was the silence. Not just regular quiet, but a dead, empty silence. Even the wind seemed to stop rustling the leaves. Then I swear I could smell something, not anything I could recognize, but musty and damp, like rotting leaves under a whole winter's worth of snow. Look, I'm not the type to get spooked easily. But something about it set my teeth on edge. Figured maybe it was time to head back, just in case the weather turned for the worse, and that's when I saw it. At first, I thought it was a deer, caught in a patch of sunlight between the trees. But as I got closer, I realized there was something wrong with the shape. Too big for a deer, too squat. And it moved funny, sort of lurching, head held low to the ground. Now, I'd seen my share of critters in the woods, bears, elk, even some wolves up in Canada. But this, this was different. Its skin had a weird, slick sheen to it, almost hairless, and it was a sickly grayish color. Its head, I still tried to forget it sometimes. Too large for its body, all elongated and stretched, with dark, empty eyes that seemed to look right through you. I froze. Didn't breathe, didn't blink. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't natural. And the whole time... It got closer, shuffling slowly but steadily towards me. The smell of rot intensified, and I realized with a sick twist in my stomach that's what it had been following, my scent. I was its prey. I don't know how long I stood there, but suddenly, the thing stopped. Its head snapped up, and I heard a rustling from the trees on my left. Before I could even process that, it was gone vanished into the undergrowth like a ghost. I waited a few more minutes, heart pounding so loud I was afraid the damn thing could hear it. But nothing. Not the creature, not the birds, nothing. In that moment, I think I truly understood what it means to be utterly alone. Finally, I snapped out of it. I wasn't sticking around to find out what the hell had startled it off turned and bolted back towards the clearing, didn't stop running the whole way. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves, made me flinch, expecting those empty eyes to be right behind me. Got back to my truck shaking, hands clammy. I started the engine and gunned it down the gravel road. I must have broken every speed limit back to Helena, didn't look in the rearview mirror once. Folks around town give me these knowing looks now when I mention the place. Apparently, there are all sorts of stories about those woods, disappearances, strange sightings, the whole shebang. I never paid them any mind before, figured it was just bored locals trying to stir up some excitement. Well, let me tell you, there's nothing quite like being hunted by something that doesn't belong in this world to make you a believer. I haven't been back since, and I don't intend to. That clearing, that thing, it's like it left a stain on my soul. Some things you just don't come back from.
I've been in and out of Bakersfield since I was a kid, see? My uncle lived here, but he ain't what brings back the bad memories. Never had a reason to stay long. The sun beats down, the food's mostly chains, and ain't a soul who stays interesting past a couple drinks. This time, though, something felt off. I pulled into town late August for the funeral of a guy named Arlen, a friend of my uncle's. Now, I don't do funerals. Kind of feels pointless when the person's already in the ground. My uncle begged, though, said I was the only family Arlen had left, some lie like that. I figured, what the hell? Maybe meet someone worth shooting the breeze with, grab a burger. I'd head out the next day. Turned out, Arlen lived way out of town, on this dry-ass road with nothing but scrub and a few ranch houses. It felt like hours getting there. Even weirder, the funeral was in the guy's own backyard. Small crowd, all dressed in black like I was. There wasn't even a coffin, just the hole already dug. The air felt heavy. I caught snatches of whispers about some accident— Arlen being out late, and the way he was found. Didn't get the whole story, but the gist gave me chills. Uncle introduced me to a couple folks. I think their names were Elroy and Karen. Elroy had this sad sack look about him. Karen kept her distance like I smelled bad. Afterwards, I did what you do at those things. Tried to eat, make small talk. Nothing was sticking. I could feel eyes on me, the desert buzzing in my ears. Figured getting out of there was the best plan, and told my uncle I'd be back to visit him soon. Before I could get to my car, Elroy was beside me. Hey, listen, I know this is messed up, Arlen and me being close and all. He stopped, cleared his throat, then said real quiet. But you don't look so good. Something... Well, something ain't right here. You want to come back to my place for a beer? I live a few miles down. Now, I'm no stranger to weirdness, but this felt like a whole different kind of weird. Still, I'd never been one to turn down a cold beer. Yeah, all right, I told him. Maybe I just need out of this Sunday. The thing I noticed hit in Elro's place was how quiet it was. Not like peaceful quiet. Like a dead quiet. Didn't hear birds, no wind rustling, nothing. His house was kinda dinky, that pale wood that makes you think of splinters. Inside, it was all browns and yellows, like nothing had been changed since the seventies. We had those beers back in his kitchen. Elroy, he kept fidgeting. Finally, he slams down his can and leans towards me. This might sound nuts, he whispers, but something's been going on. Since Arlen, it's like the desert's come alive, you know? He wouldn't look me in the eye, just started rambling about how his dogs wouldn't go outside, how the nights felt wrong. Here's the crazy part, kinda resonated with me. Like what? Can you be more specific? I asked him. He hesitated, took a long swig of beer. I dunno. Listen, couple days back, before dark? I thought I saw Arlen. Not like his ghost or nothing. But him, alive, standing stock still by the barn. Only thing was, he trails off, looks at me, his face real pale. He looked wrong. Like stretch too thin, you know? Eyes too wide and dark. Damn near black. The hair on my arms went up, but I tried to play it cool. Maybe just grief, man. Making you see things. He shakes his head hard. No. It ain't natural. And Arlen, bless his soul, he ain't the only one. Couple head of cattle went missing last week from the McGregor's place. Nothing but blood left behind. Like something ripped him apart. My stomach started to nin. You think there's some kind of animal out there? 
he nods grimly. Or something worse. We gotta be careful. Can you stay the night? Strength in numbers, maybe. Now look, I'm not afraid of much, but being out in the middle of nowhere with some guy spouting tales about whatever he was talking about, that was enough to send me running. I told Elroy I'd head back to my uncle's, just wasn't feeling up to the drive so late. He kept trying to stop me, saying it wasn't safe, but I brushed him off. That was my mistake. Sun was down when I hit the road. It felt different, the air charged and thick like before a storm. My headlights swept back and forth across the scrub, picking up nothing but the occasional scurrying thing, eyes flashing yellow in the darkness. I was tense, heart pounding faster with every mile. I must have been near halfway back when I heard it, a rustling from the side of the road. I hit the brakes so hard I nearly swerved off the blacktop. Squinting into the darkness, I saw a shape detach itself from the shadows, tall, way too tall, and moving all jerky like its limbs were too long. For a second, it just stood there in the beams of my headlights, and Jesus, I don't even know how to describe what it looked like. Skin pale as moonlight stretched over a body that seemed to shift and warp its head bald and bulbous, with eyes. The scream that tore out of my throat wasn't even human. It lunged for the car, but I was already stomping the gas, tires squealing, dust choking the air. I didn't look back until the lights of Bakersfield glimmered on the horizon. I still don't know what the hell that creature was, or if Elroy was right about something preying on the folks out there in the Badlands. But I tell you this, I won't be going back to Bakersfield. And I sure as hell ain't never spending another night in that damn desert. I worked my night shift stocking shelves at the big box store in Vernal, Utah. Vernal's a small town, kind of like Mayberry, you know? Everyone knows everyone, and if they don't, they know someone who does. Point is, nothing much happens here, which is why I love it. I'm not the adrenaline-seeking type. Give me a quiet night and a good book any day. So, when things started getting weird, I'll admit, I was a bit freaked out. It began a couple of weeks back. Just little things at first. A misplaced box of cereal here an empty display there. I thought it was maybe me being tired, or maybe one of the daytime crew getting sloppy. Turns out, either was the case. One night, I heard a noise in the hardware aisle. A clank of metal, then what sounded like something heavy being dragged. That ain't normal, not for a closed store. I walked over cautiously, peering down the aisle, flashlight in hand. Sure enough, a few boxes of nails were spilled on the floor. That in itself, no big deal. But what got me was the footprints. They were huge, like a man wearing size 20 boots or something. And not regular boots either, these prints had three long toes, big, thick ones. I stared at them, my brain refusing to make sense of what I was seeing. It was like a bad joke like some B-grade movie monster had stomped through my store. I told my boss, Roger, the next day. Of course, he figured I was pulling his leg, or maybe had an episode. See, I take medication for anxiety. So, anytime something out of the ordinary happens, Roger looks at me with those pitying eyes, figures I'm seeing things. I let it slide for a while. But then it happened again, this time in pet supplies. A bag of kibble torn open, a trail of those same giant footprints leading further into the store. That's when I started to get real worried. I knew I wasn't crazy, but I also knew no one would believe me. One especially foggy night, 
while I was in the back room sorting a shipment, I heard it again, the shuffling, heavy footsteps moving through the aisles. Then silence. Every muscle in my body tensed. I grabbed a box cutter off the table, not much of a weapon, but better than nothing. Taking a deep breath, I stepped out of the back room and into the store. The dim overhead lights cast long shadows that danced with the fog curling in from the cracked warehouse door. My heart was hammering in my chest, and I could feel sweat soaking through my work shirt. Who's there? I called out, my voice shaky. This store's closed. You better get out now. The only reply was the creak of something shifting in the darkness, and a faint, musty odor that filled the air. It smelled, wrong, like damp earth and something sharp, almost metallic. I moved slowly through the aisles, my box cut a grip tight. I was scared, but I was also determined to see what was going on. As I turned a corner, I saw movement in the camping aisle just ahead. I crouched down, edging myself closer until I could peer around the corner. That's when I saw it. Let me tell you, whatever it was ain't something you see every day, or any day. It was tall, maybe seven feet, lanky and hunched over. Its skin looked hairless, pale, like it hadn't seen the sun in a century. But that ain't the half of it. Its head, that was something else. Bald and elongated, with a narrow, almost beak-like nose. Its eyes, they glowed in the dimness. A faint green, like a cat's, but bigger, meaner. It was crouched down, tearing into a package of freeze-dried food. I watched, mesmerized, horrified, as it ripped off chunks with its gnarled hands and shoved them into its weirdly shaped mouth. It hissed and growled as it ate, like some kind of feral animal. Realizing it hadn't seen me yet, I slowly backed away, my heart pounding a deafening rhythm in my ears. Once I was far enough, I turned and ran, not looking back, not stopping until I was bursting through the back room's exit into the parking lot. The fog swirled around me, the air thick and heavy in my lungs. I didn't know where to go, couldn't risk going home. Whatever that thing was, it might follow me. Desperation hit me, and I remembered my old pal, Ezekiel. Zeke's a bit of an outsider, kind of a conspiracy nut type, but he's good people. He lives in an old cabin up in the Uinta Mountains, figure that's as good a place as any to hide. He won't question me, probably not even be surprised if I tell him about the monster in the store. I drove all night, half expecting to see that creature's glowing eyes appear out of the fog at every turn. I reached Seek's place just as the sun was starting to rise, exhausted and shaking like a leaf. I banged on his door, and a minute later there he was, eyes bleary with sleep an ancient shotgun slung over his shoulder. "'Whoa, Jace, what in tarnation!' he exclaimed, his drawl thick and slow. I stumbled past him into his cabin, collapsing on the worn couch. Zeke didn't ask questions right away. He just fixed me a strong mug of coffee and sat on a creaky armchair, waiting patiently until I was ready to speak. I told him everything— starting with the noises in the store, the footprints, and finally, the creature itself. When I finished, Seek didn't laugh or give me those pitying looks. He just sat there, stroking his beard, a thoughtful expression on his weathered face. Finally, he spoke. Jace, you ever heard tell of skinwalkers? Skinwalkers? The word was familiar something I'd heard in passing but never really paid attention to. Some kind of Navajo legend, ain't it? I asked, confused. That's what folks say, Zeke replied, taking a long sip of his coffee. But they ain't nothing mythical. They're real, and they're dangerous. Shifters, witches gone bad, walking in the skin of beasts. You think that's what I saw in the store? 
A skinwalker? It sounded crazy, even as I said the words, but somehow crazier to think that some mutated creature was loose in my town. Zeke poured me another shot of something that burned like fire going down. Now, Jace, he said, his voice low and serious. Skinwalkers, they ain't the kind of thing you mess with. They got powers you wouldn't believe. I shuddered, the image of the creature flashing in my mind. So what do we do? I asked, desperation in my voice. We gotta be smart, Zeke said. First thing, we figure out what this thing is after. Skinwalkers, they always got a purpose, whether it's revenge, hunting, or just plain evil. Need to know what we're up against. We poured over ancient books filled with half-forgotten lore by the dim light of Zeke's crackling fireplace. Hours passed, the cabin filled with tense silence, broken only by the turning of pages and the occasional hiss of the flames. Finally, we found it. A passage that described a creature called an Elisophilea, a shadow-dwelling spirit, twisted and deformed, hungry for flesh. Its lore spoke of a thirst for causing chaos, leaving a trail of death and destruction. That's when it hit me, the missing customers, the reports of strange animal attacks all around Vernal in the past weeks. It wasn't just some crazy coincidence. It was connected, all of it. Zeke, this thing, it's been behind all of it, ain't it? The disappearances, the killings, I said, my voice thick with dread. Zeke nodded grimly. This ain't a job for the police, Jace. This is our mess now. I spent the next few days holed up in Zeke's cabin, learning all I could about the Nelissophilea. Turns out, they could be hurt, even killed, with the right weapons. But those weapons, well, they weren't exactly what you find at your local hunting shop. Silver, blessed water, specific herbs and chants. All stuff you only hear about in the movies. Zeke, with his outsider ways, had a surprising knack for this sort of thing. Come nightfall, we were armed and as ready as we'd ever be. We drove back to Vernal, my heart pounding like a drum against my ribs. Arriving at the store, there was no sign of the Nelissa Philea. That didn't lessen the tension at all. We knew it was there, lurking in the shadows. Zeke and I split up, covering more ground that way. I cautiously moved through the aisles, flashlight cutting through the gloom. My senses were on high alert every creak and rustle setting me on edge. After what felt like forever, I found it, back in the hardware aisle. It was crouched in the shadows, its form nearly blending in with the blackness. I took a steadying breath, raised my weapon, a crossbow loaded with silver-tipped arrows Zeke had fashioned, and aimed. The Nelissophilea sensed something, its head snapping up those glowing eyes locking onto mine. It let out a piercing shriek, the sound slicing through the still air. Before I could pull the trigger, the creature lunged. I barely managed to dodge, the arrow flying harmlessly past it. I stumbled backwards, fear and adrenaline pumping through me. As it moved toward me, I saw it clearly, its long twisted limbs, pale skin stretched tight over bone, its mouth a gaping maw filled with razor-sharp teeth. I fired again, but this time with less accuracy. The arrow pierced its shoulder with a sickening thud, and then Elisa Philea roared in pain. Enraged, it charged, swinging those massive clawed hands. We battled in the narrow aisle, boxes and supplies flying as we clashed. I dodged and weaved desperately trying to stay clear of its monstrous reach. Just when I thought I was a goner, Zeke's voice boomed through the store. Over here, you twisted son of a dash, Zeke yelled. I glanced over to see him brandishing a vial of something glowing and a bundle of dried sage. With a furious roar, the Nelissophilea turned towards him, leaving me a moment to catch my breath. 
Using that precious moment, I knocked another arrow, took a shaky aim, and released. The arrow hit true, burying itself deep into the beast's chest. It shrieked, rearing back, stumbling from the force of the impact. Zeke seized his chance, flinging the vial of holy water at the creature. The glass shattered, the water soaking into its flesh. The Nalusophilea howled in agony, its skin steaming and blistering where it came in contact with the blessed liquid. Seizing the moment, I rushed forward, pulling out Zeke's old silver hunting knife. The monster was momentarily weakened, and I drove the knife deep into its chest. A deafening screech echoed through the still air, a sound so horrific it made my bones rattle. The creature shuddered violently, and then, just like that, it went still. The glowing eyes dimmed, its form dissolving into an inky black mist that dispersed into nothingness. The silence that followed was deafening. I stood there, panting, soaked in sweat and the stench of the monster. Zeke walked up to me, placing a comforting hand on my shoulder. He smiled at me, his old eyes glinting in the gloom. Now that my boy, he said, was some damn fine monster hunting dot. We told the sheriff about a wild animal attack. He didn't believe us, of course, but I guess everyone needs a good story sometimes. It took weeks for Vernal to recover, for things to go back to normal. Me? I never fully went back. I couldn't get those glowing eyes, that feeling of pure evil, out of my head. I moved away shortly after, couldn't stay in the same place after everything that had happened. Sometimes, late at night, I still think I hear the sound of claws dragging on concrete. I jump at every shadow, and I swear, just sometimes, there's a sharp, metallic smell lingering in the air. I grew up in a small town in the Ozark Mountains, population barely breaking 3,000. Don't ask the name, it's the sort of place even GPS forgets. Anyway, you get used to the quiet, the way everybody knows everybody's business. Makes it real easy to spot the stranger in town. I was working nights at the gas station, same routine I'd been doing since I was 16. Seeing those same local faces day in and day out. That's why this fella stood out like a sore thumb. We don't get new blood here often. His truck was a piece of junk. Rust eaten, probably rattled more than it rolled. He climbed out of the driver's seat, tall dude, lanky, like a scarecrow come to life. His face was weathered and pale, like he'd been inside for too long. He shuffled towards me, hunched over a little. Fill her up, he rasped, and damn if his voice didn't send a chill down my spine. His eyes were sunk deep into his skull, a strange, murky green color, kinda like swamp water. Made me wonder if the dude was sick or something. I went about my business, the whole interaction was giving me the creeps. Guy kept glancing around the parking lot like he was expecting trouble. It was just the two of us in the dead of night, and let me tell you, a man like that makes the silence feel even heavier. Finally, the tank's full, and he hands me a worn-out ten-dollar bill. Now, here's where things get weird. His hand, God, I'll never forget that hand. It was wrong. The fingers were too long. Knuckles bulging like they might snap. Worse, though, was the skin. It was smooth, almost slick, and cold, clammy cold. I swallowed hard, tried to ignore the feeling of revulsion crawling up my neck. Took his change and watched him as he limped back to his truck. He drove off into the night, and I took a deep breath, trying to calm my nerves. Little did I know... That was just the beginning. The next week, old Mrs. Patterson goes missing. 
Now she was a bit of a recluse, but she always came by the store for her weekly supply of cat food. When her neighbor raises the alarm, a chill goes through the town. Folks start locking their doors at night, whispering about the stranger. About three nights later, during my usual shift, I'm stocking the shelves when I hear a scraping sound outside. Heart pounding, I sneak a glance at the security camera. It's him, the lanky fella from the gas station. He's pacing in circles by his truck, hunched over, muttering to himself. I grab the phone before my brain catches up, but there's no dial tone. The line's dead. Panic starts bubbling up in my gut, but then the figure turns towards the store. His gaunt face is smudged with something dark, and his eyes, there's a wild glint in them, like the glint of an animal. He starts banging on the window, making that scraping sound again. I duck behind the counter, praying the door will hold. Then I think about Mrs. Patterson and the dread sets in Bone Deep. It's a small town, nowhere to hide, nowhere to run, and nobody to call for help. The banging gets louder, more frantic. The glass is starting to crack, and I know he won't stop until he's inside. I scramble under the counter, squeezing into the space beneath the cash register where we keep the shotgun for emergencies. My hands are shaking hard as I load it. I don't want to hurt this guy whatever he is, but I sure as hell won't let him hurt me. The front door crashes in with a splintering boom, and I hear the telltale sound of his ragged breathing filling the store. I grip the shotgun, try and calm my rapid heartbeat. If he finds me down here, a shadow looms over the counter. I hold my breath, finger hovering over the trigger. One wrong move, and it could all be over. Come on out now, boy. He croaks, and his voice sounds both raspy and slick somehow. Like a snake spitting words. He starts creeping around the edge of the counter, those long limbs moving like they don't have no joints. He's getting closer, and I gotta make a decision. But my brain's stuck frozen in a loop of pure, cold fear. I can't see his face, but somehow, I know he's grinning that thin mouth stretching in a smile that promises nothing but pain. The thing, whatever it was, rounds the end of the counter. I get a good look at it, gangly limbs, skin stretched tight over bone, almost translucent. And the face. God, the face. It ain't human, not by a long shot. Those swamp water eyes are way too big for its skull bulging like they might pop clean out. And the mouth, it splits too wide, crammed with needle-sharp teeth. He lets out a sound, a sort of hissing chuckle that makes my blood run cold. Then, without warning, he launches himself over the counter. I have a split second to react. I fire, and the shotgun blast tears through the air. The noise is damn near deafening in the closed store. He lurches back, and I see a spray of blood, a ragged hole in his shoulder. He stumbles, crashing into a shelf, sending bags of chips and candy flying. Now I'm on my feet, heart pounding. I rack the shotgun, loading another shell as he turns back towards me, a snarl pulling his thin lips back. He lunges again, and I squeeze the trigger. Another thunderclap and this time he crumples to the floor. He lies there, twitching, and a foul acidic smell fills the air. After a moment, the movement stops. I poke him with the barrel of the shotgun, just to be sure. He ain't getting back up. Trembling, I dial 911. When the cops arrive, it's chaos. They swarm over the store, securing the scene, taking photos, asking me questions. I try my best to explain, but I sound crazed, even to my own ears. They can't identify the body, ain't got no records, no ID, nothing. 
News gets out fast. Pretty soon, it's the talk of the town, and then the whole state. Cryptid hunters, conspiracy theorists, they all flock in, trying to get a piece of the story. But me, I keep quiet. I know what I saw, and I know nobody will ever believe it. They chalk it up as a drifter attack, some transient gone bad. Case goes unsolved, fades into another weird piece of local lore. My life never really goes back to normal. I quit my job, spend most of my time holed up at home, shotgun within reach. I still hear that scraping sound in my nightmares, see that freakish grin in the shadows. Weeks turn into months, then years. Still, there's this nagging unease in the back of my mind. Because I'm not so sure it's over. Every now and then, I'll see some news story about an animal attacked in a weird way, or some person just gone missing out in the woods. And a part of me wonders, could it be? Thing is, deep down, I get the feeling that the swamp ain't the only place these things lurk. They're always out there, hiding in the places where the light don't reach. The Ozark Hills? Yeah, they hold a lot more than quaint towns and friendly folk. Out there, the world still has sharp teeth, and I reckon they always will. People started calling it the gas station ghoul, whispering the name like a curse. I ain't never told nobody about what I think it might really be, that the name ghoul is way too tame. See, in the darkest parts of my mind, I think back to the folktales my grandma told me, stories of old, hungry things that snatch folks in the night. They call them wampus cats down here, whispers of monsters in the deep hollers. Now, I ain't the superstitious type, but after that night, well, let's just say I ain't sleeping so soundly anymore. I moved to Boulder Creek, California a long time ago in the Santa Cruz Mountains. There were lots of redwoods here and I loved spending time in nature. My name's Eldon. I lived with my friend Narek and his little brother Zora. We'd gone to college together and Narek had been nice enough to let me crash with them while I found my feet in a new town. It was supposed to be temporary. One afternoon, we were in a rush trying to get a hiking trip in before the sun went down. The Santa Cruz Mountains were no joke. These trails could get rough, so you always wanted extra daylight. We'd picked the Saratoga Gap Trail because it was relatively close, but we ended up taking a wrong turn early on. Didn't think much of it at the time, just figured we'd make it a longer loop and find our way back eventually. As we pushed deeper into the mountain range, the woods started feeling different. The trees didn't look as tall as they had earlier. The air felt strange to me, kind of heavy, and the hairs on my arms started to stand up. Zora was usually the most talkative of us, rattling on about who knows what, but even he fell silent as we went. Something about the silence felt off. There were no birds— no bugs, nothing. Then we reached a clearing and there it was. The first detail I noticed was the smell. It hit us like a wave, rotting meat mixed with something oily and burnt. Then I saw its shape and couldn't unsee it. At the center of the clearing was a huge nest, made of branches and dead stuff, a pile of debris. But it also looked like it was growing out of the ground like there was something living underneath pushing it up and out. Right in the middle of this twisted nest stood a creature. I've never seen anything like it. It looked humanish, but stretched and wrong, kind of like those deep-sea fish that get warped from the pressure. No hair, just sickly pale skin pulled tight over muscle and bone. Its mouth was too big, full of sharp teeth like needles. The damn thing turned and looked right at us. We froze. 
Every part of me was screaming at me to run, but it was like something had clamped down on my brain. The creature didn't make a sound, just tilted its head like it was trying to figure us out. That seemed to be enough to snap Sora out of it. He yelled, Run! We bolted. It was pure survival instinct. We didn't look back, just charged down the trail like it was on fire. We could hear the rustling and snapping as it chased after us. I tripped, rolled, and smashed my knee hard on a rock. Narek dragged me up. I don't remember if he even said anything. We were both grunting and trying to breathe. We kept running, the trail getting fainter and fainter. The noise behind us was getting closer. I glanced over my shoulder and saw the pale figure break through the trees. It was gaining on us. I stumbled again, pure exhaustion taking over. Narek and Zora could have kept going, left me behind. Maybe it would have been distracted enough for them to escape. But they didn't. Keep going, I'll hold it off. Narek yelled. There was no time to argue. He turned and faced the creature, his arms going up like a boxer ready for a fight. I kept moving, Zora pulling me along. I couldn't even bring myself to look back. We ran blind, crashing through the woods. By some twisted miracle, we found the trail again. We sprinted down it, lungs burning, legs ready to give out at any second. We were gonna make it. I could almost see the main road, hear the cars, safety waiting for us. Then, it was dead quiet. Zora and I skidded to a halt. No sound, no movement behind us. We stood there panting, trying to catch our breath. Had we outrun it? Was it gone? Just when I started to think we might be in the clear, I heard it. But not from behind us, from up in the trees to the side. A snapping sound and a high-pitched screech that almost ripped through my head. The last thing I saw was a flash of pale flesh and those needle teeth lunging towards Zora. My mind went numb. It couldn't process what was happening, only that I was standing there, alone and useless, while the creature, that thing, took Zora. All at once, the shock wore off and I started yelling. Incoherent screaming. I charged after them, not even caring what happened to me. I had to get him back. He was just a kid, my friend's little brother. Just as I reached the edge of the trees, I saw Narek. He was lying on the ground, still as stone, and the thing was crouched over him. It was tearing at him, ripping and biting as Narek's thrashing grew weaker and weaker. I kept yelling, but it was futile. My legs wouldn't carry me any further. The world blurred. All I could feel was this burning hatred and a desperation that made my stomach clench. Then I saw it, Narek's hunting knife lying in the dust a few feet away. Driven by a rage I didn't know I had, I lunged forward. The thing was completely focused on its meal, ignoring my pathetic charge. I snatched the knife up, screaming like I'd gone insane, and stabbed it in the back. Maybe it was just shock, or maybe my blade caught something vital, but the creature let out a piercing shriek. It whipped around, knocking me to the ground and sending the knife skittering away. I scrambled back, ready for it to finish me off, but there was a strange gurgle in its throat and it stumbled backward. I was on my feet in an instant, grabbing rocks and smashing them into its head. The creature staggered and something changed in its eyes. It wasn't the cold, predatory look it had before. There was fear and confusion in it. Maybe that hesitation was all it took. I picked up the knife and lunged forward again. This time I struck true. The creature howled and then fell silent. I didn't stop until its form was completely still, and even then I kept going driven by some sick sort of vengeance. There was blood everywhere, mine, 
the creatures, and Zoras. When I finally collapsed, my body felt like it was on fire. I couldn't make out shapes anymore, just blurry colors and pain radiating from every corner of me. The last thing I heard before everything went numb was the sound of sirens in the distance. I don't know how long I drifted in that in-between state. Sometimes I would hear the faint sounds of hospital monitors and hushed voices. Then there would be screams and the smell of rotting meat. The paramedics found me barely alive on the trail. They never found Zora, and Narek didn't make it through the night. They told me the official story was something about a mountain lion attack. That's easier than admitting they don't know what happened. That there's something out there no one understands, no one's prepared for. The doctors patched me up and signed my release papers. Said the nightmares and constant feeling of something watching me were just PTSD. It was a polite way of saying it was all in my head. But I know what I saw, and I know it's not over. Whatever that thing was, maybe it wasn't alone. Maybe they're more intelligent than anyone knows. I started carrying Narek's knife again. Sometimes the only way to fight monsters is to become a little monstrous yourself. The locals call it the Skinwalker of Saratoga. I spent last weekend with my friends at a lakeside cabin in the Adirondacks. You know, the usual deal. Beers, fishing, that kind of stuff. This trip had a little twist, though. See, one of my buddies, Reese, is big into ghost stories and cryptid sightings. The whole shebang. He'd read something about a local legend nearby and couldn't resist dragging us into it. Me? I'm Carter, by the way. Yeah, I'm more of a... Believe it when I see it. Guy. The place we stayed at was pretty remote. Nestled up against Lake Algonquin with trees so close in, you felt like they might swallow the cabin whole. Perfect for Reese whole spooky lore thing, not so much for my sanity. The afternoon we got there was sunny but with that chilly edge that makes the hairs on your neck prickle. We decided to check out the lake before dark. Reese, of course, had this whole spiel laid out for us. Some tale about an old hermit who died out on the lake in the 70s and supposedly still haunted the area. His story was all misty water, glowing lights, that kind of thing. Pretty standard spooky stuff. We humored him. I couldn't tell if my other friends, Maeve and Tamson, were buying it. By the time we strolled down the rocky path to the lake, that golden afternoon light was fading casting long shadows. Now, I ain't scared of no ghosts, but being out in the woods with that creeping twilight makes you jumpy. Reese, naturally, wanted to get on the water. Tamson had the same bright idea, suggesting a canoe trip to this little island in the middle of the lake. Maeve and I exchanged a look. Nah, didn't sound like a great plan to either of us. But with Reese all hyped up and Tamson getting that spark in her eye, it was outvoted. Maeve, ever the pragmatist, said fine, but only for half an hour. No getting caught out in the dark was her rule. So, there we were, piling into this old, weathered canoe that had seen better days. I'm not a big fan of things that float, to be honest. Reese and Tamson took their spots with those practiced, graceful movements of experienced Connors. Maeve gingerly stepped in, her eyes wide, and I clumsily followed suit. The water was like glass, barely disturbed as we paddled away from the shore. The trees were mirrored on the still surface, everything impossibly quiet. Now, don't get me wrong, the scenery was beautiful. But I couldn't shake this feeling, like we were being watched. Reese, oblivious, was already narrating about the hermit drowning right about where we were headed. Maeve let out a huff. 
Can we just enjoy the sunset without the horror stories, please? This is beautiful. Tamsin smiled, but her eyes darted around the shoreline. I wouldn't mind one of those glowing lights, though. Think we could be that lucky? I'm sure it's just a foxfire, I grumbled, trying to sound nonchalant. But the hairs on the back of my neck wouldn't settle down. We were halfway to the island when it happened. Up ahead in the water, cutting through those perfect reflections, something broke the surface. A dark, lumpy shape, moving way too fast to be natural. What the hell is that? Maeve's usually calm voice had a tremor in it. Reese, for once, was speechless. His paddle froze mid-stroke. Tamson just whispered, Is that... The thing, whatever it was, bobbed up again, closer now. It was huge, at least the size of a large dog, and seemed to be... undulating? Like it was made of shifting pieces rather than one solid mass. And the smell, dear lord, that smell. Rotting fish and something sickly sweet, like a flower gone bad. It hit us all at once, and Maeve retched over the side of the canoe. I don't know who screamed first. Me, probably. What I do know is that we all started paddling like hell had broken loose. The water churned and the canoe rocked precariously threatening to dump us into the cold depths. The creature kept pace. No, it wasn't keeping pace, it was gaining. Its segmented body, for that's what it seemed to have, rippled beneath the water, propelling it with impossible speed. Maeve was sobbing now, half prayers, half curses. Reese's face had gone as pale as a ghost, ironic, really. Even Tamson, all her adventurous spirit snuffed out, just dug her paddle in and gritted her teeth. Just when it looked like that monstrous lump was about to surface right next to us, the island loomed ahead, a beacon in the darkening twilight. We somehow managed to steer the canoe towards a narrow, muddy inlet and practically leaped out, abandoning ship without a second glance. We scrambled up the bank, slipping and sliding on the wet leaves and rocks. There was no time to think, just the blind instinct to put distance between ourselves and whatever that thing was. Halfway up the hill, we crashed into the underbrush. Reese tripped and I landed squarely on top of him, shoving myself up to keep running. We burst through the trees into a clearing and there, finally, we stopped. Collapsing to the ground, gasping for breath. Someone had built a bonfire here, probably a long time ago. The ring of stones was blackened and weathered. We huddled around it, sharing shaking breaths and disjointed words. It was full night now. Looking back toward the water, we saw nothing but the faint moonlight glinting off the waves. We stayed there till dawn, huddled around the dead fire. Not a single one of us said a word, just listened to the night sounds, the occasional splash from the lake, the rustle of leaves. And in the back of my mind, the fear that one of those splashes might not be natural. Finally, that gray light started to filter through the trees, and we crept back down to the shore. The canoe was still there, half swamped in the reeds. Nothing else. No sign of that creature. Reese, his face still drained of color, was the first to speak. Let's just, let's get out of here. We were all thinking it. No way were we sticking around to find out what daylight might reveal. We got the canoe bailed out, loaded up our soaked gear, and paddled back to the cabin with grim determination. It was a tense drive home. Tamson stared out the window, lost in thought. Maeve alternated between angry outbursts about the ruined weekend and shaky silence. And Reese, he was just shell-shocked. As for me, all I could think was, thank God that thing didn't come back for us. We parted ways back in the city, the air thick with unspoken questions. 
Reese tried to crack a joke, something about never going canoeing again. None of us laughed. In the weeks that followed, things didn't just go back to normal. It's like we all carried that fear with us, a lurking shadow on the edges of everything. Tamson took to leaving all her lights on at night, her once bright apartment turning into a harsh, sleepless cavern. Maid became obsessed with self-defense, taking classes, always checking over her shoulder on walks home. Me? I couldn't get that putrid smell out of my head. Showers didn't help. It followed me everywhere. There were nights I'd wake up in a cold sweat, convinced I could still smell it in my room. Reese was the one who suggested we talk about it. At a little hole in the wall bar, we laid it all out. The terror, the helplessness, the shame of being scared out of our wits. Telling the story, it felt smaller somehow, less monstrous. And as we talked, a determination started to take root. It was like, no, screw this. We weren't going to let whatever that thing was control us. We started researching, digging up old tales, local news reports. There was nothing specifically about Lake Algonquin, but similar stories existed here and there, all over the Adirondacks. Strange sightings in the water, disappearances. Some even echoed that hermit legend Reese had told us. A name started to take shape in our minds, the ripple back. Because of how it moved in the water, that undulating, segmented thing. It felt right, somehow. It made the unknown a bit more solid, gave us something to point at. One day, a few months later, Reese called with news. An old newspaper clipping about a fisherman gone missing on Lake Algonquin back in the 70s. The article mentioned the man's boat being found, ripped and gouged, like from some enormous animal attack. That was our smoking gun. The four of us, we had to go back. Not for revenge or any grand hero stuff. We just needed to know. To see if this ripple back thing was real, and if so, to do something about it. Maybe warn others, or try to figure out some way to contain it. I'm not going to lie, the idea of going back there terrified me. But there was something stronger than that. A kind of stubborn defiance. I wasn't going to live in fear anymore. We packed up, gear piled in my old truck. It felt different this time. Not the carefree weekenders out for an adventure, but something more purposeful, more desperate. The cabin looked the same, untouched since we'd left it in a panic. It was hard being back, those memories of scrambling through the dark woods pressing down on us but we swallowed that down and got to work. Reese, ever the researcher, had a plan. He'd brought sonar equipment, old-school stuff, but he swore by its reliability. We spent hours on that lake, scanning the depths, Tamson and me manning the oars while Reese and Maeve took readings. Most of the time, it was just the regular contours of the lake bottom, the occasional school of fish. Nothing like what we'd seen before. Day was fading, and with it, our hopes. We were about to call it quits when the sonar spiked, a huge, irregular mass lurking under the boat. My heart pounded in my ears. Adrenaline kicked in, and suddenly my exhaustion vanished. There! Reese pointed at the screen, a trembling, jagged line marking the thing below. Tamson started rowing, the boat slicing through the water. The sonar pinged, faster and faster, that shape rising up. I felt a surge of nausea, the memory of that first encounter clawing at my insides. Stop, Maeve whispered, her voice strangely calm. She held up a hand, palm out, like she was trying to hold the creature back by sheer force of will. Tamson hesitated, then let the oars trail in the water. The boat slowed, the monster still a good distance beneath us, but not that far, not really. 
Reese fumbled with his backpack. The rifle, he muttered, pulling out the old hunting gun he'd brought along. Reese, no! I shouted, but it was too late. He clicked the safety off and leveled the barrel at the water, his knuckles white. A gunshot echoed across the lake, the sound impossibly loud in the sudden stillness. I flinched, my ears ringing. Maeve cursed under her breath, and even Tamson had a startled look. The surface of the water remained unbroken. The sonar screen blipped weakly, and then, nothing. That massive shape had disappeared. A rush of relief washed over me, tinged with guilt. Had Reese hit it? Was it injured, or worse? You could have warned me! I yelled at Reese. He just shrugged, a nervous smile splitting his face. Well? Is it? Tamsin trailed off, her gaze fixed on the dark water. We waited. One breath, then another. An eternity seemed to pass. And then, the surface of the lake bulged, just a subtle ripple at first, then growing, growing, until it erupted. The ripple back. No, this was different. This was Skittermaw. I just knew it. Bigger, and instead of undulating, it seemed encased in a segmented shell, like a nightmarish beetle. Its head, enormous and misshapen, burst from the water, revealing rows of needle-sharp teeth. And the eyes, those milky, unseeing eyes, locked onto our boat. A scream tore from my throat. Tamsin fell backward, knocking into Reese, who lost his grip on the gun. It splashed into the water, sinking like a stone. We were defenseless. The skittermaw lunged. The world tilted as the boat capsized, tossing us into the icy depths. I thrashed, choked on lake water that tasted of that same sickening rot. Surfacing, gasping, I saw Reese flailing a look of pure terror on his face. The skittermaw was bearing down on him. He tried to swim, but it was too fast, a dark blur in the murky water. There was a flash of red, a scream cut short, and then nothing but the water rippling as the ripples swallowed him whole. I was screaming too, barely aware of it. Tamsin had reached me, tugging me away, her eyes wide with terror. We swam for shore, blind instinct propelling us. Maeve was already there, crouched on a rock, reaching out to us. She pulled us out of the water, her hands strong and sure. We sobbed, huddled together, staring out at the lake now quiet once more. We didn't talk about Reese. Didn't have to. The hike back to the cabin was a blur. We gathered our things in silence a desperate efficiency born of shock. There was no question of staying another night in that cursed place. Driving away, I kept glancing in the rearview mirror, half expecting the skittermaw to burst out of the trees. Even back in the city, I couldn't sleep. Every creak in my apartment sounded like claws on the floor, every gust of wind like a monstrous breath. We never went back to Lake Algonquin, Maeve disappeared for a few months, taking a leave from work, going off-grid. I heard rumors she went up north, seeking out some old hunter who supposedly knew about things like the Skittermaw. Tamson and I, we stayed in touch. It was grim comfort, talking to someone else who'd seen it, who knew. A twisted kind of bond, forged in terror. We didn't spread the story, of course— who would believe us? Life went on, but it was never quite the same. There's a shadow over everything now, a sliver of doubt when I look at any body of water. Like what if? What if it's not just legends? And what if there are more of them out there, these creatures lurking unseen, just waiting for their moment?
I remember that summer in North Carolina vividly, even though it feels like a lifetime ago. I was fresh out of college, working a dead-end job in Greensboro to save up some cash before trying to make it as a musician in Nashville. Back then, I was all about late nights and chasing a good time with my buddies, so when my friend Cade had a line on a cabin for a long weekend, we jumped at the chance. The place itself was nothing fancy, just a bare-bones fishing shack tucked way out in the woods. The kind of place where cell service is a myth, and the neighbors are all critters instead of people. But hey, when you're twenty-two, you just need a place to crash and a cooler full of beer. Plus, the view of that lake in the early morning light was enough to make you forget the mosquitoes and the lumpy mattresses. Cade had invited a couple of other guys I knew only vaguely, Nash and Harlan. They were cool enough, a little more reserved than me, but down for anything. I figured by the end of the weekend, we'd be best friends or at least have some killer stories to tell. Turns out, we were right about the stories. The first day was exactly what we signed up for, fishing off the dock, jumping into cool off, a couple of questionable rope swings, too much beer, and a bonfire late into the night. But the second day, well, that's when things got weird. We woke up late. Well, everyone except Harlan. He was up at the crack of dawn, muttering about the woods, the quiet, something feeling off. We chalked it up to him being a bit of a nature nerd. Harlan was one of those guys who'd rather spend a day hiking than a night at the bar. The afternoon drifted by lazily. I was getting sunburnt. Nash was determined to catch a whopper, and Cade kept trying to convince me to attempt a backflip off the dock. Spoiler alert, I still can't do a backflip. Around dinner, Harlan came back from one of his nature hikes, looking shaken up. I swear he lost some color in his face. Guys, you're not gonna believe what I found, he said. We scooted closer, expecting some tale about a giant turtle or some weird berries you shouldn't eat. Instead, his voice got this hushed, almost scared tone when he started talking about animal tracks. They were big, Arlen said, his eyes fixated on the scuffed wood of the porch. Not any animal I recognize. And some, some were almost like footprints, but wrong. I'll admit I rolled my eyes. Harlan being Harlan, you know? Cade tried to make light of it. Nash looked mildly curious, and I was more worried about how burnt my shoulders were. But Harlan wouldn't let it go. No, really. His voice sounded strained. It's like whatever made those tracks is walking on two legs, but its feet are way too wide, and the toes. He trailed off, then shivered. I've got to go back, I need to make sure. Before we could stop him, he was already grabbing his hiking pack, muttering about needing to take some more photos. The sun started to set, casting long shadows across the lake. The mood shifted. It wasn't just the fading light. Even the cicadas seemed quieter. Cade and Nash kept trying to break the tension, but the jokes felt forced now. I started wishing we'd packed it up and gone home right about then. Night fell, and it was pitch black except for our campfire. Usually, we'd be swapping stories or playing dumb card games, but we sat there, the silence stretching between us. And that's when we heard it. A crack from the woods. A heavy snap of a branch underfoot. We all froze, every one of us straining to listen. Harlan? Cade called out, but his voice was barely above a whisper. No answer. Another snap, another rustle of leaves, closer this time. My heart pounded in my ears. Nash slowly stood up reaching for a rock to use as a pathetic weapon if it came to it. He didn't look nearly as smug as he did when he was baiting his fishing hook. Then the noises stopped. The forest around us held its breath, 
and we held ours with it. I wanted to believe it was Harlan, stumbling back after losing his way in the dark. I wanted it to be anything but what my gut was telling me it was. Cade got up, his face tight. This is stupid. Harlan's probably just trying to scare us. He took a flashlight and held it out. Harlan! Cut it out, man! Still nothing. My stomach twisted with dread as Cade walked into the trees, sweeping the weak light ahead of him. Nash and I watched from the porch, our muscles tight enough to snap. After what felt like hours, Cade reemerged, breathing heavy. No sign of him, he said, and those damn tracks. The rest of the night is a blur. We kept the fire blazing, taking turns on watch. Every creak, every rustle sent us flinching, and the silence in between was just as suffocating. I don't think any of us slept a wink. Then, just before dawn, we heard it again. This time it wasn't subtle, not branches snapping but something heavy crashing through the undergrowth. Closer. My mouth went dry, and I realized how desperately I needed to pee, but I didn't dare move. We braced ourselves, huddled together on the porch like that would make a difference. It was stupid, we were sitting ducks, but somehow it felt safer than being alone. And then, it stepped into the clearing. There aren't good words for it. I can try, but it'll never fully do it justice. It was tall, way taller than any man, hunched over with these long, spindly limbs that were all wrong. Its skin. Jesus, it was like stretched leather, pale and mottled but with a texture like a plucked chicken carcass. Its head, it didn't have a normal face, more like a skull stretched out, with these pits where eyes should be. I swear, it grinned at us, a gaping maw with rows of jagged teeth. I don't know who screamed first. It didn't matter. We scrambled back, Cade fumbling for the cabin door. I tripped and all I could see were those impossibly long limbs reaching for me, those claws coming down like rusted knives. My legs moved on instinct, propelled by pure terror. I was back in the cabin, the door slammed shut behind me. My lungs burned, but I didn't stop scrambling until every deadbolt was slid into place. Cade! I choked out. Nash! Where are you? Then I heard it, the rasping growl from outside, followed by a horrific thud as the thing slammed against the wood. There was a splintering sound, and part of me expected to see those claws rip right through. We're in here, man! Nash's voice called back, cracked with fear. I stumbled towards the back bedroom, my heart pounding a deafening rhythm in my ears. I found them huddled near the window. Cade gripping a hunting knife he must have found in a drawer. Did you see it? Cade whispered, the knife shaking in his hand. He looked haunted, all bravado gone. Yeah, I managed to squeak out. Then I was babbling, spilling out every detail, the stretched out skin, the skull head, the teeth. It all sounded crazy, even to me but their terrified faces told me they believed it. The thing kept battering the cabin. It was relentless. Wood splintered, glass exploded inwards, and each impact sent us flinching. I had this horrible image in my head of the claws ripping through, snatching one of us, dragging us back out into the darkness. We gotta get out of here, Nash insisted, his voice tight. There's got to be another way out. We searched frantically, tossing aside junk and cupboards, desperately hoping for, what? A hidden door? A trap tunnel? But it was a fishing shack, not a Bond villain's lair. As if to mock us, the thing outside paused for a moment. The only sound was our ragged breathing and that damn, dripping faucet I should have fixed. The roof? I suggested, but even as I said it, 
I knew it was a dumb idea. The dock, Kate said suddenly. If we could make it to the boat. It was a sliver of hope, a plan born of desperation. But desperate was all we had left. We made the decision in a split second, a silent agreement fueled by blind panic. The front door was a no-go, so we busted through the back bedroom window, showering ourselves in broken glass. We sprinted for the dock, the thing shattering the back door just seconds behind us. I swear I felt its hot breath on my neck, heard a raspy snarl like it was laughing at us. The boat was our only hope. We fumbled with the ropes, hands shaking, the outboard motor roaring to life just as the creature broke free of the cabin. I cut the line, shoving us away from the dock. Its long, spindly figure came loping towards us, splashing into the water, those impossibly long limbs reaching. Cade was at the helm, steering us out into the blackness of the lake. I didn't dare look back, but I could hear it, the thrashing, the snarls, even the sickening sound of it tearing through the tiny boat with frustrated rage. We didn't stop, not until we hit the opposite shore, not until we stumbled into the trees and collapsed in a tangled pile of gasping, sobbing relief. It was only as the first pale light of dawn began to pierce the gloom did we finally turn back towards the cabin. It was a wreck. Splintered wood, smashed windows, and the lingering stink of something rotten and feral. But there was no sign of the creature. We made it back to town somehow. I barely remember the drive, the blur of hitchhiking, convincing a passing trucker to take us without asking questions. We filed a police report, told them about some crazy guy out in the woods, a bear attack, anything but the truth. The cops were kind enough, but I could see the disbelief on their faces. In the aftermath, there were the nightmares, they still come sometimes, the therapy, the way the three of us were bound together by something terrible and unspoken. Harlan was never found. The cops did a search, the news picked up the story as a mystery, a missing hiker. I moved away, left Greensboro behind as fast as I could. It took me years to build a new life, to find somewhere that felt safe. Nashville became a distant dream, replaced by a quiet job, a small apartment, a stubborn refusal to ever spend a night in the woods again. And sometimes, late at night when the shadows shift, I think I hear it. That guttural snarl, the cracking of branches, and the whisper of its name in my nightmares, the strider. I moved to Boulder Creek, California a long time ago, almost 15 years, when I was 29. I'm a software engineer and I was looking for a quiet place to live, a slower life and a place to unwind. I'm Tarek, by the way. Nice to meet you. Boulder Creek is a tiny town nestled deep in the Santa Cruz Mountains, barely a village. I like the quiet, the woods, I really enjoy spending time outside. It was a Friday afternoon, and I had just finished some freelance work at my place. I needed to head into town to pick up my mail. It's usually a lot of junk, but sometimes you get something good. The general store also has decent coffee, so I thought, why not? I hopped into my trusty old Jeep, and that's where things got weird. Not right away, mind you. It took a little while. I was coming down Bear Creek Road, heading for town, just taking in the scenery. You know how some places just feel right? Well, this is it for me. Huge redwood trees towering over the road, sunbeams filtering through the leaves, a creek gurgling alongside. Honestly, it's hard to beat the beauty and the quiet. Sometimes you just need nothing around you. Except lately, something has been not quite right. 
For a while, I'd been getting a funny feeling, like I was being watched. It started subtly, a brief glimpse of something moving at the edge of my vision, odd noises in the middle of the night. Nothing I could put my finger on. But that unease had been growing, and this afternoon, it was starting to gnaw at me. I shook my head, trying to clear it. This was crazy. I was probably just letting the isolation get to my head. But just as I was starting to relax, I saw it. A flash of movement in the trees, right along the side of the road. Too big to be a deer, and honestly, not the right shape either. My heart skipped a beat, and not in the good way. I stopped the jeep right in the middle of the road, thankfully. Traffic's basically non-existent out here. I strained my eyes to see into the trees, but whatever it was had vanished. Taking a steadying breath, I told myself I was being stupid. Yet I couldn't shake the feeling of being spied on. I scanned the surrounding trees again, and then I saw it, further back, a massive shape hunched behind an old redwood. I had never seen anything like this before, not out here anyway. Whatever it was, it looked big and mean. I fumbled for my phone. A shaky picture is better than no evidence at all, right? But as I raised the camera, I swear the thing moved. Not a natural movement, more like it glided a good ten feet back into the trees without making a single sound. I was frozen in place, a chill running down my spine. Then I heard it, a low growl, just above a whisper, that seemed to come from everywhere at once. That was it. I didn't even try to get the picture. I dropped my phone, slammed the jeep into gear, and hit the gas, leaving a cloud of dust behind me. I kept my eyes glued to the rearview mirror, half expecting the thing, whatever it was, to come barreling out of the trees after me. But nothing did. I made it into town in record time and parked in front of the general store. I couldn't stop shaking. My hands clenched so tight around the steering wheel they were starting to ache. I took a few deep breaths, trying to calm down, before finally stepping out of the car. Inside, the store was a comforting hub of normalcy the smell of fresh coffee, old Mrs. Bennett chatting about her prize-winning zucchini, kids laughing over by the candy display. For a second, it felt like everything was right again. Then I saw Bryn. Bryn's a bit of a local fixture, always up for a chat. She leaned across the counter. You okay there, Tarek? You look like you've seen a ghost. Now, I'm not the type to gossip, but the unease was still riding high. Funny you should say that, Bryn. I replied, trying to keep my voice level. Think I might have just seen something, something weird up on Bear Creek. Her eyes widened in a mixture of alarm and curiosity. Oh, yeah? Like what? I hesitated. How do you describe something you can't believe yourself? Well, it was big and fast, and it definitely wasn't a bear or a mountain lion. Her brow furrowed. You know, some folks have been whispering about strange sightings for a while. I didn't think much of it. Figured it was just bored teenagers playing tricks. But you, Tarek. I wasn't liking where this was going. What kind of sightings? What have people been seeing? Bryn looked down, as if searching for the right words. Finally, she said, People say it's enormous. Shaggy, gray fur, a snout like a wolf, but it stands on its hind legs, walks like a man. They've been finding odd tracks, too, bigger than any animal around here. My heart sank. That thing in the woods, it matched Bryn's description to A.T. I wasn't crazy after all. Suddenly, the coffee didn't seem quite so appealing, and neither did sorting through junk mail. Listen, Bryn continued, I know I sound like a loon, but you seem shaken up. Here. She reached under the counter 
and pulled out a small flask of moonshine. Hair of the dog, so to speak. Maybe it'll settle your nerves. I took the flask with a grateful nod. I could use something to take the edge off right about now. I was about to head back out when I noticed Sheriff Mike by the door, his usual stoic expression laced with concern. Tarek, you here? We've been looking for ya. Alden and Kaya went missing yesterday. They went hiking up on Bear Creek Road. My mind started racing. Alden and Kaya were avid hikers, experienced outdoors of folks. They'd know those woods like the back of their hands. The fact that they were missing didn't bode well. Sheriff Mike saw the look on my face. Something wrong? He fixed me with a serious stare. I hesitated for only a moment before deciding to come clean. I think I saw something up on Bear Creek, just now. Something big, not natural. I heard a growl too, it. His eyes widened as he made the connection. That thing folks have been talking about. You think it's got something to do with Alden and Kaya? I didn't know what to think. But a cold certainty was settling in my gut. I don't know, Sheriff. But I can show you where. We followed Sheriff Mike's cruiser back up Bear Creek Road, a knot of dread tightening in my stomach. When we reached the spot where I'd seen the creature, I pointed it out, my voice barely above a whisper. The place had a bad vibe now. Whatever energy had been unsettling before was now thick as molasses, full of menace. Sheriff Mike, along with a few other deputies, scanned the dense woods. Okay, Tarek, stay with me. Let's go on foot, slow and careful-like. Their guns were drawn. It wasn't a comforting sight. Each step forward felt like walking into a trap. The trees loomed silent and accusatory. Leaves crunched under our feet, the only sound in an eerily quiet world. Then I spotted it, a track. Massive, not an animal I recognized. My blood ran cold. Whatever made that print was way bigger than anything that should be roaming the Santa Cruz Mountains. And then we saw more, bloodstains. That's when Sheriff Mike stopped and raised a fist. We all froze, every nerve in my body screaming. Whatever was out there was close. It was watching us. And it had done something terrible to Alden and Kaya. A twig snapped up ahead. Something moved, a massive, dark shape darting in and out of the shadows. There! Sheriff Mike shouted, raising his rifle. We fired a volley of shots, the noise echoing unnaturally through the forest. The shots hit their target with a wet thump. I heard a howl, a mix of pain and fury. It shook the very ground beneath our feet. And then silence. Cautiously, we moved towards the spot where the thing had been hit. The blood stains led deeper into the woods, forming a gruesome trail. Whatever it was, it was big, and it was hurt, but not enough. Not enough to stop it. Dread turned to determination in my gut. It had taken Alden and Kaya, and now it was wounded. We had to track it down. Finish this. We followed the blood trail for what felt like miles over rough terrain, the adrenaline starting to wear off. We found an abandoned shack deep in the woods. The door was off its hinges, wood splintered as if something had forced its way in. There were more blood stains. A lot more. The air inside the shack was rank with the sickly sweet smell of old blood and something foul I couldn't place. I didn't want to find out. It was dark, but even in the dimness, we could see enough. This creature, whatever it was, had dragged Alden and Kaya up here, what was left of them. For a split second, I wished I had stayed in town, had a drink at the saloon instead and then rage surged through me. 
That feeling of dread that had been haunting me all these weeks wasn't just fear. It was something primal, hunter or hunted. This thing wasn't just a danger to me, it was a threat to the whole town. If I didn't stop it, who would? With that thought firmly in my head, I drew my own gun. Sheriff Mike, I don't think he'll die that easily, I said, my voice raspy and low. He locked eyes with me, and the understanding in his gaze mirrored my own. You thinkin' what I'm thinking, Tarek? I just nodded. Some threats needed fighting, even the ones you couldn't fully understand. The sheriff gathered his men. All right, we wait for nightfall, said a trap. We get this thing one way or another. He clapped a hand on my shoulder, a grim look in his eye. You know, son, folks around here, some still whisper stories about the old days, the ones passed down through generations. Back then, these woods had teeth. We may have just gotten ourselves a taste tonight. As the last slivers of daylight disappeared and dust descended on the forest, the air grew thick with anticipation. The deputies took up positions, forming a perimeter around the cabin. We armed ourselves with heavy firepower and a hell of a lot of determination. Waiting for something awful in the twilight is a special kind of torture. The shadows danced and whispered, making shapes that my fear turned into monsters. Then it appeared. Bigger than I ever imagined, easily seven feet tall and impossibly wide, its shaggy fur matted with blood. Its muzzle was long and wolf-like. But those eyes, they held a chilling intelligence. It stalked out of the woods, snarling, a low rumble that shook the ground beneath my feet. They call it something different out here, Skinwalker, maybe. But that's just a name. Some things you just can't give a name to. That's scarier. We opened fire, a storm of bullets ripping into its flesh. It roared in fury but kept coming. And then I saw it, the one shot that mattered. In the split second before it lunged at Sheriff Mike, the moonlight caught its chest. I squeezed the trigger one last time. The bullet tore through its heart. With a final, shuddering groan that echoed through the woods, the creature fell, its massive body crashing to the earth. The aftermath wasn't pretty, questioning, clean up, trying to make sense of the senseless and the funerals. The whole town felt the loss of Alden and Kaya like a punch to the gut. News crews descended on Boulder Creek for a brief, morbid thrill, then left, but the echoes of that day lingered. Life didn't just snap back to normal. It couldn't. Something had broken, a veil I didn't even know existed torn open. I don't sleep much these days. I still see the thing in nightmares, hear that howl in the empty quiet between midnight and dawn. But sometimes you walk through darkness to see what lies on the other side. Maybe it ain't so pretty, but at least it's real. I lived all my life outside Helena. Montana, a real cowboy town nestled tight in the Rockies. If you ain't been, you ain't seen nothing like it. I grew up with the best hunting partner a guy could ask for, my cousin, Rhett. Us Harrisons know our way around those woods better than anyone else in a hundred miles, or so I thought. Last fall, Rhett calls me up one Friday. Hey, Clayt, he says, all peppy. You ready for the opening of bow season? Now, I'd be a fool to say no, even though we hadn't been out in a while. Work, family, you know how it goes. But there's nothing like the first morning of the season, mist hanging low on the trees, the smell of pine, and the silent thrill of tracking a buck. Hell yeah, rat been waiting all year. Good. Pack your gear. I'm picking you up round 4 a.m. Rhett, true to his nature, is always curt, 
all about the hunt. Bright and way too early Saturday morning, we pile into his old truck, thermoses full of strong coffee. Got a spot in mind, Brett grins, that little glint in his eye that always spells adventure. Turns out, he heard whispers about a ridge way up north, off the usual trails supposedly, nobody goes up there. Big bucks, prime hunting. Now I don't mind a challenge, so off we go. The usual dirt track turns into a barely there path, and soon we're ditching the truck and hiking in the pre-dawn darkness. We walk for a good two hours, the woods getting denser and wilder by the minute. This ain't the Montana I know. The trees seem taller, the silence, kinda oppressive, you know? We finally set up at a spot Rhett likes, an outcrop overlooking a small clearing. Just as the sun starts to peek through, a magnificent buck steps right out into the open. Easiest damn shot I've ever seen. Your turn, Rhett whispers, nudging me with his elbow. But something feels off. My hand trembles on the bowstring, and a weird prickle crawls up my neck. The buck senses it too, turns its head, and right then I see it. Behind the buck, there's something else, moving in the shadows between the trees. It's big, way bigger than any deer, and it's dark, not the natural shapes of the woods. Its bulk dwarfs the big buck, but in that half-light, I can't quite make it out. Clay, take the shot! Red hisses, but I'm frozen, that dread sinking in. Whatever that thing is, it steps out into the clearing, and all I can do is stare. It ain't any animal I've ever seen, not in these parts or anywhere. It stands on two legs, towering at least eight feet, maybe more. But its legs are skinny, way too long for its body, ending in these freakish, huge clawed feet. Its torso is thick, gnarled like old roots, covered in patchy fur. And the arms. Jesus, the arms are even longer than the legs, dragging on the ground, ending in the same clawed fingers that could rip a man apart. The scariest part, though, is its head. Human-shaped, in a grotesque sort of way, but bald and stretched, like someone had taken a normal head and pulled a taffy long. Too black. Beady eyes bore straight into mine, and I see an intelligence there that makes my blood run cold. It moves with this impossible grace, like it shouldn't exist in this world. The buck finally senses it too, but it's too late. In a blur, the thing lunges, those arms shooting out. The buck doesn't even have time to scream before the claws sink into its flanks. Blood fountains in the crisp morning air and the clearing turns into a slaughterhouse. Rhett's yelling at me to run, to do something, but my legs won't budge. All I can do is watch as the creature rips into that deer, tearing it apart with sickening ease. And when it finally turns back to look at us, I see that its stretched mouth is slick with red, its black eyes gleaming brighter now. Move! Rhett screams shoving me hard enough to snap me out of it. We take off, scrambling through the trees, back the way we came. He knows these woods better than me, thank God. We don't stop till we reach the truck, stumbling in, gasping for air. As Rhett peels out, I look back through the dusty window. That clearing is empty, the trees just trees again, but the image of that thing is burned into my brain. Now, I ain't the type to spin yarns. I've seen grizzlies, mountain lions, survived a blizzard that coulda killed a lesser man. But what we saw that day ain't no creature of this earth. We ain't never been back there, needless to say. Some things you best leave alone. We didn't even talk for the rest of the drive, a silence heavier than any hunt hanging thick in the truck. And all I could think was, whatever that was, it let us go. This time. Back home, we tried to convince ourselves it was just a trick of the light. A bear, maybe. A damn ugly bear with real freaky proportions. 
but deep down we both knew. It wasn't natural, not anything we'd ever encountered and never would again. We made a pact don't talk about it. Ever. But how the hell do you just forget something like that? Nights were the worst. I couldn't close my eyes without seeing that elongated face, those gleaming black orbs, and the blood, God, the blood. I kept busy, threw myself into work, tried to drown it all in whiskey, but it lingered like a festering wound. Thing is, not everyone in town was content with sweeping things under the rug. Weeks later, Marcus, the guy who runs the little bait and tackle store, pulls me aside. Clate, he says, all serious like, none of his usual goofy chatter. There's something strange going on. Hunter's been disappearing in the woods. Folks fin in carcasses, not deer, not elk, something else. Real tore up, like no predator I've ever seen. A knot forms in my gut. Could it be connected? How many missing? My voice is hoarse. Three, no, four now. Sheriff's been doing searches but ain't turning up nothing dot. Marcus looks rattled. They're saying wild animal attacks, but Clayt, I saw one of those remains. Ain't no bear or cougar doing that. That settled it. Red knew it too. He avoided my calls at first, but when I finally cornered him, he admitted to seeing the same kind of mangled remains out hunting. He was scared, just like me, but beneath that fear bubbled a stubborn anger. Turns out, a group of hunters were organizing a search party. Some mix of vigilante justice and morbid curiosity. And damn if Rhett and I weren't right in the thick of it. We went back to that godforsaken ridge, a dozen men armed to the teeth. The atmosphere was electric, a weird mix of bravado and bone-deep terror. We fanned out in groups, scanning the trees for any sign of our, of that thing. Hours pass, and nothing. I start thinking maybe we were crazy, maybe it was just shadows and fear playing tricks on us. Then, one of the hunters screams, further up the slope. We sprint toward the sound, hearts thundering in our chests. And there it is. The creature crouched over the bloodied body of Tom Carter, one of the guys in our group. When it sees us, it lets out a shriek that ain't human, ain't animal, it's pure nightmare. And it charges. The first few shots ring out, and damn if they don't seem to hit, but it doesn't slow down. It plows through us like we're nothing, knocking men aside with those terrifying arms. I watch, frozen for a moment, as it tears into another hunter, leaving a bloody ruin in its wake. Then, primal instinct kicks in. I raise my rifle, aim for those eyes, and let out a desperate shot that echoes through the clearing. Must have hit something vital because the thing stumbles, lurches back, and emits a strangled cry that raises the hair on my arms. Then it just disappears back into the trees with that uncanny speed. We're left reeling, injured but mostly alive, staring at the carnage it caused. No amount of explaining away, no amount of pretending to forget, is gonna cut it this time. The aftermath ain't pretty. The sheriff brushes us off, talks about crazed wild animals and mass hysteria. Papers report a rogue bear even though we all know that ain't true. But the whispers persist, especially down at the local watering hole. Hunters trade stories, adding more and more outlandish details until the thing becomes something out of legend. Locals started calling it the Spindle Walker. We never went back to that place in the woods. I still see it sometimes, in my nightmares. That lanky shape silhouetted against the moon. I jump at every rustle in the trees, every sound too strange to be familiar. Rhett and I, we're different now. Not broken, but hardened in a way I can't explain. We got a glimpse behind the curtain, 
saw that there are darker things out there than we ever could have imagined. And damn if those things don't leave a mark on your soul. 